welcome everyone uh, on behalf of the Residential School History and Dialogue Center at the University of British Columbia um, to this dialogue on the federal government's proposed bill, Bill C-15, on implementing the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples in Canada. We are so happy that uh, everyone uh, has decided to join us today, panelists, uh, presenters, and participants. Uh, I think we're at over 650 people who are uh, joining us here today. Uh, my name is Roshan Donish. I'll be chairing the session and moving us through uh, the morning here out west and the afternoon for some of you where you are. Um, and I'll set up the, the session and our speakers and agenda in just a few minutes, but we want to begin in the right way. And so I'd ask, uh, call on uh, Elder Shane Point of the Musqueam First Nation to uh, give us a territorial welcome. To say thank you to all of you for joining today's dialogue. We are coming to you from the ancestral territory of the Musqueam people. Musqueam village is 4,000 years old. We have been here for 9,000 years at a number of different villages. I welcome all of you luminaries to this moment to share your thoughts and to say your truth. I welcome you here on behalf of all of the children from Musqueam, their families and their esteemed elected leadership. Please, while you're here, be respectful to each other, listen to each other, most importantly, most importantly, open your hearts, open your minds to what it is you're going to hear. The great Coast Salish word is not Samoth. Natsamat simply translated means we are one. We are one. I'm so grateful today to be a part of this very special moment because it's an acknowledgement that we exist as human beings that we as Indigenous people across Canada have a right, have a right to the same freedoms and equity as the Canadian citizens do. So please, once again, welcome on behalf of all of the children 
the Musqueam, their families, and their esteemed elected leadership. Thank you very, very much. Enjoy the dialogue. Once again, please open your hearts and open your minds to the truth and the words you are going to hear. Thank you. Thank you, Elder Point, for uh, <clears throat> both starting us in the right way and reminding us of the spirit and focus of uh, what we're here to dialogue about, listen to, learn about today. Um, this dialogue has been been uh, designed to provide a range of perspectives on uh, the proposed legislation by the federal government to implement uh, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And there's really, uh, I think, three contexts in which, uh, as a background, in which this dialogue and work is situated. One, of course, is the long history of colonization in Canada and the work that's being done to address that, the legacy of colonization, the advocacy of indigenous peoples over generations to bring us to this point we're at today and the many points to come uh, in that work. Um, you know, the work of forming proper relationships between indigenous peoples, governments, uh, laws, jurisdictions, and those of the crown, whether it be where treaties have been formed in the past and are yet to be honored or in parts of the country where they haven't been formed yet. Um, and of course, all of this work engages many pressing urgent issues, whether it's those of racial justice and injustice and systemic racism to problems and challenges related to the well-being of children and families, housing, communities, um, that we see all across the country. So it's in, in that context that this kind of dialogue and work uh, arises. The second context is, of course, of the United Nations Declaration itself, uh, which was completed in 2007 uh, through an international process of deliberation that involves states and Indigenous peoples. Um, it, uh, you know, has been a, a focus of much advocacy for many, many years. Uh, and uh, was really brought, uh, I think, to the much broader public attention of Canadians and broader public discourse through the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in 2015, where it was identified as uh, the framework for reconciliation in a number of the calls of action. Then in 2016 was endorsed without uh, conditions or reservations by the federal government and it's what role should this human rights framework, the United Nations Declaration, is an expression of international human rights uh, norms, long accepted norms in the specific context of Indigenous peoples. What role should it play? How can it advance this vital work uh, in Canada, this long overdue work uh, that continues? And the third context, uh, as we talk about, and we'll hear many perspectives on the federal proposed federal legislation, is the issue of legislation itself. Uh, there is not a long history of legislation aimed at trying to uphold Indigenous rights in Canada. In fact, the tradition has been quite different through the Indian Act and others is the use of legislation as a tool of colonization rather than of rights affirmation and recognition and implementation of the uh, sovereignty and uh, uh, governance and laws of Indigenous peoples. So. This is, has some new elements to it, this use of legislation in this way. The recent years we've seen uh, more emerging legislation in this regard, and it raises questions uh, about the role of legislation, the right legislation, uh, what should be seen in legislation, and we're going to hear many perspectives on that today. Um, in terms of how this uh, session will unfold, we're, we're going to run until 9.30, and we have, uh, 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 we'll have a a brief overview of uh, Bill C-15 from Dr. Mary Ellen Trapelafon, the, the direct director of the uh, of the center, and then we're going to have two panels uh, provide a range of perspectives on the bill, uh, critical, analytical, descriptive perspectives. Um, each speaker will have uh, ten minutes to uh, share what they wish to share. 
um, and then we'll have about 20 or 30 minutes at the end of each panel for questions and answers. There is the ability for questions to be posted in a Q&A box, um, which you should all have access to. Um, and during the Q&A session, I'll uh, lead uh, some discussion through some of those questions. Uh, just uh, note again, we're over 650 people have registered. I'm sure we won't uh, get through all of the questions that people have, but there is chance for follow-up afterwards as well, and we'll put some information about that uh, afterwards. Um, there also is a background paper with some ideas and discussion uh, that was sent around, and that's also can be accessed through the website for this uh, uh, session on the registration page. Um, so that's sort of just the mechanics of our agenda and our session uh, today, and I'll, uh, I'll be uh, setting up each panel uh, shortly, but uh, next, and just to set our stage, I'd ask uh, Mary Ellen Trapel Lafon to uh, share her 10 minutes overview of uh, Bill C-15. Thank you, um, Roshan, and thank you as well to Elder Shane Point for the welcome today, and thank you for everyone to join our virtual circle. Um, I also want to reinforce the um, introductory comments from uh, Dr. Roshan Dinesh, that this is a dialogue meant to inform and encourage discussion. And so we welcome that discussion. And of course, also uh, from a UBC perspective, this is being hosted by the Residential School History and Dialogue Center. I'd like to thank um, the staff and the associated researchers that work with the Centre for facilitating the discussion today and, and, and finding space for us to have a dialogue. Um, I want to do a run through in terms of uh, in the interest of informing the participants that may be logged in here today, a bit of an information sharing around what is in this um, legislation and what do we need to think about as we begin this dialogue. Bill C-15 uh, has been introduced at first reading, so it has been introduced in the House of Commons. As, as we know, in the parliamentary process, we go through three readings, goes into the Senate, it goes through the same process, and there's an opportunity for committee and study. So parliamentarians, some of whom we'll hear from today, will be debating this issue, and of course, uh, Canadians and Indigenous people will have an opportunity to hear, have voices heard. So I'm also very pleased today that we have um, Indigenous scholars and as Indigenous people, I think it is important that we do um, raise our voices as individuals and as scholars, but also we hear from chiefs and leadership uh, on their views and ideas. And I do think in legislation like this, the views of Indigenous people do count significantly because is this something that Indigenous people feel is part of a new process, a new relationship. As Roshan has said, there's been a significant history of colonization and we wanna make sure that um, our thinking and our assessment and our analysis of this bill is one that can look at whether or not it fits and meets the requirements that we have to ensure that the rights of indigenous people are implemented and upheld. Um, and I'll just ask um, uh, our staff to load, the, I have a brief PowerPoint, so I'll just walk through it very quickly. And this PowerPoint is available for you as well and we will post it for the participants and it does um, track and reflect the um, the discussion paper that we've posted. So first of all, what does this legislation do? Well, first of all, Bill C-15 follows a type of legislation uh, regarding the UN declaration that's been around for over a decade. Um, it it really mo is modeled upon Bill 262, which was a private member's bill that successfully passed through third reading in the House of Commons, but was stalled in the Senate. Uh, and the Bill C-15, to some extent, also follows a model which we've seen in British Columbia, which is uh, what we call DRIPA or Bill 41, which is the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act that was passed unanimously in British Columbia last year was introduced in November and it's been in fact for a year. Um, so the bill has the purpose to affirm the declaration as a universal human rights instrument. And it also has as, as its overall objective to see that the provisions in the declaration, there are 46 articles in the declaration and a number of preambular paragraphs, that these um, 
articles become part of <clears throat> the law policy and practice in Canada, and that we work toward using these articles as a way to reset and reformulate relationships, but also to address this legacy of colonialism and the ongoing challenges that we've seen. Uh, next slide, please. I just would say that it is important that international instruments are uh, implemented into Canadian law. It is a requirement of our Canadian legal system. Some aspects of the UN Declaration have the status of international human rights norms that don't have to be implemented, like the prohibition of against genocide, that Canada doesn't have to explicitly adopt that for it to apply. It does apply as customary international law, but otherwise international instruments must be implemented. We have a federal system. There's the federal realm, Canadian law, and there's the provincial realm, as we've seen in British Columbia with BC law. So the recommendation of the TRC was all governments adopt the declaration as the framework for reconciliation. Um, so I wanted to just identify that Bill C-15 puts three distinct obligations on the federal government that are part of making this shift to a recognition and rights-based framework for implementation and reconciliation. And the goal, first of all, is the first and largest um, the substantive goal is that Canada would be required to take all measures necessary to insist that its, its laws are consistent with the declaration. And how that works is all of the laws that have been passed and the future laws need to be considered and reviewed to be consistent with the principles in the declaration and the articles. And that's a dynamic process. It takes discussion, but it does reorient the work quite dramatically and quite significantly as we've seen, for instance, with the parallel example in the British Columbia context. Next slide, please. The second obligation created by the legislation and Bill C-15 is that the federal government must establish and develop in coordination and consultation with Indigenous people, so with Métis, Inuit, and First Nations, an action plan to achieve the objectives of the Declaration. Again, the, the phrase, the objectives of the Declaration, that's a far-ranging and important principle or concept, and that can include things like, uh, that, that are expressed in the um, preamble to the Declaration, and the preamble to the bill, um, ending racism, prejudice, and discrimination, and upholding the minimum standards in the Declaration for the survival, dignity, and well being of Indigenous people. Bill C 15 sets a target to have an actual plan established within three years. <clears throat> I would note that uh, BC legislation to implement the Declaration was passed in 2019. The action planning is continuing one year in. So there is a question about whether or not the three-year period in this bill is reasonable. Certainly there have been some concerns voiced that it's too long and there's need for more urgent action. But the second overall requirement is the action plan. Next slide, please. The third obligation that Bill C-15 puts into place is it requires regular reporting. Regular reporting by the government on progress to implement the UN Declaration. I think you've jumped ahead a slide, so we might have to bump back one, please. Um, so it has the requirement in Section 7 for parliamentary review of an annual report of Canada's progress. So if the bill was to pass, Canada and a lead minister would be responsible to table a report to Parliament on the actions taken in the year prior. That report could be considered by standing committees and the Senate and would also be public. So it creates a level of accountability on progress that's undertaken. Um, next slide, please. In terms of the meaning and significant in the significance in the bill of different concepts, first of all, I just wanted to speak a bit about the preamble. The, and I speak about this because in British Columbia, when the declaration bill was passed, there was no preamble. The Canadian bill, Canada's bill, C-15, has a substantial preamble, that substantive preamble, which is quite significant. And preambles do give interpretive context to legislation, and they do have meaning, and they do have significance. And I've just highlighted two key uh, aspects from the preamble that I think are noteworthy that fit the theme that we're talking about here today, which is the need to make some significant shifts around recognition of the rights of Indigenous people, and also address discrimination. So the first one 
is a preambular commitment to respect and promote the inherent rights of Indigenous people that are inherent rights. The second is to address the issues of systemic discrimination. And I certainly would say that in British Columbia on that second principle, in the first year of the declaration coming into effect into the laws of British Columbia, we have been engaged in substantial work on addressing racism in healthcare and using the article, Article 24 in the declaration to um, provide uh, uh, an opportunity for discussion and change. And that, that work is important and interesting and significant and eliminating all forms of discrimination against Indigenous people is particularly acute and timely because we've seen during the pandemic, the extent of that discrimination and racism. Next slide, please. There have been um, a number of concerns raised about Bill C-15 and by political concerns, I would say within the Indigenous community and the First Nations community as well. Um, certainly, I uh, listen very closely and I'm occasionally asked to provide some assistance to, for instance, the Union of BC Indian Chiefs and others. And I have heard a range of concerns uh, with respect to Bill C-15. So the concerns really are threefold. One, there is a, there's an issue of concern that the bold rhetoric that government has offered since 2016 has not been matched with real action and that the principled recognition of the rights of Indigenous people and the inherent rights and self-determination has been very slow coming. So five, it's been five years and there's significant concerns and I certainly validate and acknowledge that. Um, and we've heard a lot of that. The second is a really important concept, which is the dynamic of trust and mistrust that happens to the success or failure of reconciliation. Um, you know, there's a lot of mistrust in dealing with government where governments have benefited from advancing policies based on colonialism that have deprived people of lands, that have stripped communities and people of identity. We know very well the impact of residential schools and other policies, including the ongoing impact of the Indian Act for First Nations. So there is mistrust <clears throat> and the dynamic that happens around mistrust and trust is something where government has to do the work to rebuild because the damage has been done. And, and in British Columbia, as the UN declaration is being implemented, <clears throat> and we'll hear perhaps from our panelists today, we know that building trust is one of the key parts and trust only comes by seeing actual sincere, meaningful change. So I want to acknowledge and validate that we are dealing with a very tough context of addressing this colonial legacy. But <clears throat> at the same time, I think it's valuable through this dialogue to look at whether or not this bill and the declaration has the potential to address some of these shortfalls and in terms of the colonial puzzles that we've been left with and are constrained by and uh, can have a benefit to help push us forward as the Truth and Reconciliation Commission had recommended. Next slide, please. In terms of legal concerns about the bill, <clears throat> there are, of course, a whole variety of legal advisors and commenta commentators, including members of the Indigenous Bar, like I'm in the Indigenous Bar, and we have an active um, group of uh, lawyers and Indigenous Peoples Council who exchange views. Certainly my colleague, Dr. Wilton Littlechild, who is a TRC commissioner, um, with him, myself, and many others, we're engaged in a lot of discussion about whether or not the, the legal, the bill itself is legally strong. Is it, is it, is it um, have the potential to have a good impact? I would note that we've heard a lot of concern about this bill and whether or not <clears throat> the bill and the declaration will become subordinate to what's in section 35 of Canada's Constitution Act 1982. And many of us who are well familiar with Section 35 and the recognition of the Aboriginal and treaty rights of the Aboriginal peoples of Canada in Canada's constitution, that was a hard fought provision that was added to the constitution in 1982. And the jurisprudence and litigation over the last decades have been confusing at times. There have been hard fought victories for Section 35 cases like by the Silco team that had their title recognized and protected by Section 35. Um, but along the way, the dispute and contention about Section 35 has also caused worries to Indigenous people, and for good reason. Um, the Bill C-15 does have a non-derogation clause that is protecting the rights of Indigenous people from uh, not being abrogated by the legislation. 
this is language that Indigenous people have long argued be included. I do note, though, that the non-derogation clause in Bill C-15 is not the same as the non-derogation clause that was in Bill 262, that uh, Romeo Saganish's important bill. And I think we're going to see more legal debate about whether or not the federal government would be wise to return to the language in 262 and to be more explicit that there is no attempt to undermine or lessen the impact of the declaration in Canada and to somehow make it subordinate to some um, sort of negative jurisprudence that might have developed over time. So I, I do hear this one, I'm seeing this and we're actively talking about this. Next slide, please. Just my concluding thoughts, and I know this is a brief, a very brief overview here today, but I wanted to just confirm again that the purpose of the dialogue is to support, inform and bring forward views. We do have seven papers that we've published on the Residential School History and Dialogue website, including one on this subject. And more recently, we've added a new paper on looking at addressing racism in healthcare and the importance of the United Nations Declaration as a tool to shift that. And there's a lot of practical work undergoing on that subject, so that might be of interest to some of the viewers. And uh, we also have a number of papers that look at the work that's progressing in British Columbia that is early on. And obviously we're gonna hear from Minister Rankin today who will talk a little bit about that as well as Chief Don Tom from the Union of BC Indian Chiefs who will discuss how that work is progressing. So I feel like we are at a very important um, moment to assess this legislation. And of course, none of us knows what the path of legislation will be, but the responsibility is on the shoulders of parliamentarians and certainly we do hope that they will listen to and work closely with Indigenous people from all over Canada, including um, the scholars, uh, rights holders, chiefs and others. So I'll end it at that and thank you very much again. And uh, we look forward very much to the dialogue today. <clears throat> Thanks, uh, Mary Ellen, for that quick overview of Bill C-15. Uh, I can already see it's raising many questions. Um, and they're starting to come in quite a bit. I'll just foreshadow <clears throat> for the panelists. There'll be a number of questions, I think, about the uh, meaning of implement in this context and, uh, and how that uh, operates uh, uh, in the context of this bill specifically. Um, I think we want to move now to our first panel. And, um, and uh, the... Um, uh, our, our uh, panel of political uh, com commentators and perspectives. Um, I just want to check with the staff. I think Minister Lametti, uh, the Minister of Justice uh, and Attorney General Canada is struggling to log in or late logging in, or is he here now? Does anyone? Uh, I I, I don't see him as logged in yet. Perhaps we can move on to Chief Don Tom while we okay. wait. Okay. So uh, why don't we, we'll just change the order. Chief uh, Don Tom, uh, if that's okay with you, we'll start with, uh, with you. Uh, Chief Don Tom is the Vice President of the Union of BC Indian Chiefs and the Chief of the Sartlet Nation uh, that's on Vancouver Island in British Columbia. And uh, we look forward to your 10 minutes uh, sharing perspectives. Thank you, Roshan. Um, I was promised I would go second. I'm just kidding. Uh, thank you to uh, uh, Elder uh, Shane Point for the, the prayer this morning. Hi, Chika. Asiem the Salkwain, Siem the Siea, Hi, Tsepka, Kwatsi Tsep me, Tachel Nomit to Nikwail, Na Tsanu Tsayish Nomit, Antha Kwolflitzten. I'd like to thank each and every one of you here today and thank our elder Shane Point for, um, for the opening prayer this morning. And uh, thank you to uh, this uh, beautiful dialogue that we're having here this morning. Um, <clears throat> the opportunity to meet today in a virtual circle to discuss Bill C-15 is important and welcome. Um, yesterday we met as chiefs for BC in a virtual session to exchange views and debates, uh, Bill C-15. Uh, we had a good discussion and we will continue uh, when we meet at a national level next week uh, at a virtual event hosted by the AFN. Uh, 
the Union of BC Indian Chiefs has welcomed the introduction of Bill C-15 and we have reviewed it to measure if it meets the standard set by the private members, Bill 262, uh, which was a remarkable achievement of statecraft by uh, one of my heroes, former MP Romeo Saganash. Um, this bill is a government bill and it has to be critically considered as implementing the UN declaration must be sincere, meaningful and impactful in our lives. And uh, I'd like to thank everyone for their, their prayers for Grand Chief Stuart Phillip yesterday. And um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention this today. And it's one of my favorite uh, quotes from the Grand Chief as we all know, um, he tells us reconciliation is not for wimps. And he has also said uh, to us that the test we must consider is will life be better for our people with this change? In BC 14 months ago, we saw Bill 41 pass unanimously and we have been working together with DRIPA to implement the declaration. Uh, the work can be hard, uh, but it can also be essential. And much of that work involves government of BC changing how it does business and the way it was fixed on denying our rights in government to government relationship for years. I can point to one area uh, where early progress has come. Uh, we acknowledge that uh, more work remains. In November of 2020, uh, a comprehensive review of anti-Indigenous racism in healthcare was released by Mary Ellen Chappelle Lafont. And in that report in plain sight, uh, the review was grounded in article 24 of the declaration the right of Indigenous peoples to receive health care without discrimination. The report saw thousands of Indigenous people come forward to talk about racism they experienced at the point of care, and their voices were finally heard, and racism was exposed and named. Because of DRIPA uh, and the requirement for laws and policies to be uh, BC uh, to align with DRIPA, including all the health care profession in health services. We have exposed the extent of anti-Indigenous racism that was in plain sight for years, but not addressed. DRIPA and the UN Declaration gave us new tools and opportunities to address this, and the work is on different foundation. It's not one of fighting, but validating and changing. My community, Human Rights, gave us a new opportunity to improve healthcare services for members of our nation and at our local hospital. Major effort has been put into shifting services, changing practices, and respecting the rights of our people to be treated with respect when they seek medical services. I'm excited about this change and encouraged that the system is facing something they would not face because of the declaration. This is one example of, uh, of change that, that is positive. On free and fire, <laughs> excuse me, a little bit parched cheering and I wet my whistle. <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, with uh, free prior informed consent, um, the rights and title of First Nations people in BC, there is work to be done. And uh, the, with Bill C-15, Canada can make strides and reset how it works internally and with our people based on self-determination, recognition of our legal orders, rights, and the need for fair redress and change. Canada can catch up to BC and maybe, and maybe Canada can set a national standard to bring along other provinces and territories. Is Bill C-15 a perfect bill? No, I don't believe it is. Um, the UBCIC has written to Minister Lametti and I identified areas that we would like to see improved. Um, we are working with our chiefs and uh, we will push for those concerns to be addressed. Uh, we will insist that Minister Lametti and Minister Bennett hear our concerns and that the parliamentary system listen to our ideas uh, for needed improvements. And why shouldn't they listen to us? We are the ones uh, most impacted by this and for whom this has to be right. It has to be the best it can be. I'm going to listen today to the ideas and dialogue. However, I will serve my people and my nation, uh, the Union of BC Indian Chiefs and First Nations Leadership Council of BC, uh, 
to ensure that in the weeks ahead, we, we focus on Bill C-15 so that it's strong and effective bill. Uh, we are not afraid of positive change, uh, but we also not take a second class or watering down attempt to implement the UN declaration. Uh, we don't want the declaration reduced in stature by Bill C-15 because it is the minimum standard for protection, survival, and dignity of Indigenous peoples. Most importantly, uh, we do want to, we, we do not want to lose this opportunity to see Canada do the right thing and strive for better that they have given our people in the past with a legacy of colonial laws and paternalistic approaches. And um, uh, just uh, one of my favorite quotes, and, um, and it's, uh, it's an Obama quote. And uh, the way I feel about the change that is necessary, and this is one of my favorite quotes, and uh, we cannot wait for some other time or some other person. Uh, we are the ones we've been waiting for, and we are the change that we seek. And it really is up to us to drive this change and to drive this. And I'm certainly grateful for the dialogue that is happening here today. Um, and uh, thank you, BC, for uh, hosting this dialogue. It is ever so important. And I think all of our allies out there and all of our friends who are very supportive and who are uh, standing with us to drive this change that is necessary. And it's been a long time coming and the denial of uh, some of the colonial practices will be coming to an end. And it, uh, the, the government of today, they must recognize that they uh, include uh, First Nations and include us in uh, that they just simply can't implement this on their own and they can't drive the change on their own and it has to come from us. And so I'm uh, grateful for the dialogue here today. Thank you, uh, Chief Don Tom. And uh, I mean, you introduced many uh, themes and ideas that we'll be picking up on throughout the morning, both uh, you know, wanting to hear more, needing to hear more about some of the perspectives and concerns you've heard from the from uh, your constituents uh, and the leadership across BC and elsewhere uh, about the bill, as well as the experience with implementing the uh, the uh, bill in uh, the British Columbia bill, the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act that was passed uh, almost a year and a half ago now. Um, so thank you for that. And we'll pick up many of those themes during the questions and answers. Um, I believe uh, Minister Lametti, uh, the Minister of Justice for New General of Canada has joined us now and uh, would ask uh, if uh, he was ready to share his 10 minutes of perspective on Bill C-15. Perhaps not yet. We can, why don't we, I see he's still trying to join. Why don't we uh, carry on with one more presenter uh, and then we'll have uh, Minister Lametti as soon as the uh, technical issues are resolved. So f following on our uh, schedule, uh, uh, Minister Rankin, uh, the Minister of um, uh, Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation uh, in British Columbia, if you'd be willing to share your perspectives now. Thank you so much, Foshan, and uh, I want to also thank uh, Elder Point for his, uh, his greeting, getting us started in a good way, and uh, I appreciate very much the comments of Chief Tom. I'm going to try to build on them. I start, if I may, to acknowledging that I'm speaking to you from BC's Legislative Assembly, the territory of the Lekwungen speaking peoples, the Esquimalt and Songhees nations. I'm really grateful to have been invited to this event today. It really is a, is a wonderful opportunity. And I, I wanna thank the Indian Residential School History and Dialogue Center for hosting us and especially thank uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Mary Ellen Trapella Fond and Dr. Dinesh for their uh, for their presentations thus far. Um, I'm very proud of the fact that British Columbia was the first jurisdiction to uh, pass uh, the Declaration Act, as we call it, or DRIPA, that em uh, embraced the uh, United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. 
Um, I wasn't part of that effort. I'm very proud of what we did. And I, I want to start by stressing that it was a unanimous, as, as Mary Ellen Tapelefon pointed out, unanimous effort on legislators from all three political parties. I think that's very, very important as we go forward, it rep representing all uh, parts of British Columbia and all uh, perspectives in the legislature, we came together. And of course, we couldn't have done it without the leadership of Indigenous peoples over decades in getting us here. Um, I want to join with uh, Chief Tom in recognizing one of my heroes too, and a former seatmate of mine in the Parliament of Canada, Romeo uh, Saganash. What an enormous achievement uh, on all of our behalfs, uh, not only in going back and forth to Geneva, how many times to try to ensure that they got it right in DRIPA, but also, of course, introducing Bill 262, which is essentially the precursor to what we have done in British Columbia and what Canada is doing with Bill C-15. It's because of that leadership that we've been able to make the progress we all have on DRIPA. So um, we are, of course, very supportive in British Columbia of, of, of the effort of, uh, reflected in Bill C-15 at the federal level. We think it aligns very well with what we've done. And uh, so we want to do whatever we can uh, to, to assist in, in, in getting it right. Both bills, I, th I think, can strengthen our province and our country and our economies and the future of Indigenous peoples and non-Indigenous peoples alike. I thought I would take a moment just to talk about the creation of the, of the, of the bill in our jurisdiction. Um, through Bill 41, uh, British Columbia became the first jurisdiction in Canada to recognize uh, in law the human rights of Indigenous peoples in a fundamental way. Uh, it was very well received, I think, for a couple of key reasons. One, deep collaboration with Indigenous peoples in the development of the bill, and deep engagement as well with community, stakeholders and others before and after its introduction. Um, so 18 months of work went into the drafting of this. Dozens of experts, staff and legal counsel from the First Nation Leadership Council, the province and others participated. I think I may say that this is an unprecedented level of cooperation in the history of British Columbia in any kind of legislative initiative. It was passed unanimously in November of 2019. Um, our collaborative approach to developing the bill was a tangible example of our deep commitment to building lasting relationships with Indigenous peoples. Gone are the days of one-off transactional uh, rec uh, arrangements or, or uh, uh, the like with First Nations peoples. We want, of course, to, to cite what uh, Chief Tom said, to engage in deep and profound uh, self-determination, allow us together to create space for self-determination in our jurisdiction based on respect and recognition of the inherent rights of Indigenous peoples. So I think it's really important to state that every single cabinet minister in our jurisdiction has in his or her mandate letter a commitment to reconciliation. It's now the Declaration Act is the cornerstone of the work. It's my personal preoccupation and first priority. Um, it, 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 I think it's not only important to say that it is a profound human rights document, but it's also, I think, a document to help clarity and uh, predictability going forward. In some of the materials that were provided to us, I thought it was really powerful, a metaphor that was used uh, that was uh, suggesting that what this Declaration Act does is create a door, a door to a room that has yet to be fully constructed a room that will be constructed together with government and Indigenous peoples alike. So similar to Bill, C uh, to Bill C-15, our legislation mandates our laws to, uh, to be in line with the UN Declaration and to develop an action plan in consultation and cooperation, big words, with Indigenous peoples, and then annually to report on that progress. There's a couple other things in RBC law. There's the flexibility to enter into agreements with Indigenous governing bodies, a framework for shared decision-making, joint decision-making between government and Indigenous governing bodies on matters that impact their citizens. So I think the key has been transparency and engagement both before and after. That was the key to the success of, of our bill in achieving a unanimous uh, a piece of legislation. 
And um, we, we started back in 2017 in the mandate letters to, to do this. We worked together. Uh, as I say, it was in the budget speech and the throne speeches. The First Nation Leadership Council received mandates to pursue leg provincial legislation to implement UNDRIP, and we worked together uh, in doing so. There were discussions began in 2018, and there were regular uh, updates given at all subsequent all chiefs assemblies of First Nations, the First Nations Summit, the Assembly of First Nations, the Union of BC Indian Chiefs. Once we got a consultation draft, we engaged with both Indigenous nations, partners, and a broad range of stakeholders across the province. And it was critically important, I think, that we built a constructive and shared understanding of what the legislation was and, wasn't, and what it wasn't. So there was all sorts of efforts to explain, to get people on side across the province. And uh, the BC Business Council, the BC Chamber of Commerce legal experts, they went through the bill all under non-disclosure agreements. I think that was really important because we had about 50 non-disclosure agreements with individual nations and 10 First Nations organizations. There were a total of about 170 non-disclosure agreements signed overall, and there wasn't a problem whatsoever in that process. And that allowed us, I think, to move forward cooperatively and collaboratively. Now, the action plan is now my top priority. We've got to get the action plan right. Uh, we had this little thing called the COVID pandemic, which has slowed us down, but we're working in partnership at a technical level. I, I think later on, uh, my uh, ass Assistant Deputy Minister Jessica Wood is on a subsequent panel. I know she'll talk about the technical work that's going on with uh, Indigenous uh, bodies now to develop it and get it right. Uh, we're trying to do it in the spirit of uh, required by law in true collaboration and uh, it, we're taking the time to get it right and um, we've continued to work on a number of fronts to implement the uh, UN declaration in many areas since it was passed let me give you some examples well we have a long-term uh, gaming revenue sharing agreement of three billion dollars up to three billion dollars over 25 years a revenue sharing agreement at the highest level uh, with almost 200 nations participating in British Columbia. We have a new uh, First Nation justice strategy and Doug White QC is going to speak in a subsequent panel about that. I'm keen to understand his uh, perspective on that important initiative. We've signed a few significant reconciliation agreements on working and we're working on a couple of others, but one involving Lake Babin, another with the Carrier Sakani, another one with the, the Seychelles First Nation as well. I'm also working to develop, uh, uh, in my mandate, a secretariat, a secretariat that would be responsible for the implementation of UNDRIP and particularly, we wanna get the alignment of laws piece right. So in conclusion, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission called on government as, to adopt the United Nations Declaration as the framework for reconciliation with indigenous peoples. I think we've done that successfully in British Columbia. And I think the federal bill C-15 has the potential to do that as well. But meaningful reconciliation uh, takes collaborative work and time. We're all engaged in decolonizing our institutions. And that's a lot of, a lot of history to unpack. And we're committed in British Columbia to doing that in true partnership and collaboration with First Nations. So I'm looking forward to the panel discussion. I'm looking forward to subsequent panels uh, on, on this di dialogue today. And I think it's truly an honor to be, have been invited to this important dialogue. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Minister Rankin. And thanks for uh, providing some of the context, uh, building on what Chief Don Tom said about the work in British Columbia, um, which of course uh, is a, a bit ahead of the timing of this, uh, uh, a federal bill. And of course, both bills do have many aspects in common, though there are distinct uh, elements to them. Um, some of the uh, themes you pointed to, you raised uh, language like consult and cooperate, which is does appear in many articles of uh, UNDRIP, as well as both the federal bill and the provincial bill. Um, just to foreshadow, um, not unexpectedly, a number of uh, questions that have come in do touch on issues related to uh, free prior informed consent and understanding of that. And so that will be a topic that we move into um, uh, as we uh, move into the Q&A. Also, relatedly, 
the questions about you know what what does this change like what does the shift of uh, implementing the United Nations Declaration signalize and reflect and mean on the ground in terms of a change in direction from certain pathways we've been on so that will be another theme that we begin to explore as we move through the morning um, so i'd like now to invite our our next uh, speaker the honorable carolyn bennett the minister of crown indigenous relations to share some of her perspectives on this proposed legislation minister bennett Hello, bonjour. Annie Carolyn Bennett, Nadijakos, Toronto, Nino Najiba, Minwa. Comme ministre des Relations, encore en octobre, je me joins à vous aujourd'hui de ma maison à Toronto, sur le territoire traditionnel des Mississaugas de Credit, où nous honorons tous les peuples autochtones qui ont pagayé sur ces eaux et dans les magasins ont parcouru ces terres. J'aimerais reconnaître les territoires depuis lesquels vous participez aujourd'hui. I too just want to thank you for inviting us uh, to join this truly important dialogue. And I too want to thank Elder Shane Point for starting today's dialogue in such a good way with such a beautiful song. And, and also to Chief Don Tom to, to, to let you know that our hearts are with Grand Chief Stuart Phillips and his daughter. And it's good news that they are resting well. Um, I can't tell you how much I miss being on campus with Indigenous students. It's always been such a source of inspiration and energy, and I can't wait till, till we're able to continue this conversation in person. As you know, the introduction of C-15 was early in December, and, and to me, it was a historic day, having been at the UN, UN when Canada um, it, accepted it without reservation. And it is no doubt built on the sustained advocacy and determined efforts in First Nations, Inuit and Métis and their leaders over a number of decades. And I too would like to recognize and honor the work of former MP Romeo Saganash. As we know, his Bill 262 was the floor, not the ceiling in what is the work to introduce the UN declaration legislation. And I also want to acknowledge the ongoing leadership at home and abroad of Grand Chief Wilton Littlechild, whose vision and wise counsel have been invaluable on this journey for decades. So I, I want to express my sincere thanks to the law students here um, today because of your meaningful contributions to C15. I know some of you were in attendance at the round table in last November and we were all moved and listened uh, to your knowledge and passion and the intellect that you brought to that discussion. And I think it was a great example of what responsive engagements mean that lead to the substantive changes to make a better bill. Leading and acting on your feedback led to the, the diversity of Indigenous people in the preamble, and then led to the to the fact that that in in that that in the bill itself, um, two spirit and gender diverse people um, um, were there, and we also benefited a great deal by the two spirit and an LGBTQQIA working group uh, for the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls at national action plan working group. So, it uh, it was essential to ensuring that C15 had inclusive language um, specific um, to two spirit and gender diverse. So I think. All of you know that, 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 that we have already begun steps towards the implementation of the declaration by including it in C91, the Act Respecting Indigenous Languages, and in C92, um, the Act Respecting First Nations Inuit and Métis Children, Youth and Families. And, and the spirit intent was included in C69, requiring the inclusion of Indigenous people and Indigenous knowledge at the first idea of a new project. So C15 provides a critical framework that will guide the Government of Canada's efforts. It pushes us in future governments to review all existing and future laws to ensure that they adhere to the Indigenous rights reflected in the Declaration. So we see what happens when Indigenous rights are ignored, misunderstood, or disrespected. We only have to look at the tragic death of Joyce Eshaquan, 
to witness the change that needs to happen at all orders of society, by governments, by civil society, and schools or institutions like hospitals. Systemic racism is embedded in our country's institutions, including in healthcare, and that has had catastrophic generational effects on First Nations, Inuit, and Métis communities. I'm so grateful for the recent conversation with Dr. Marilyn Trapella Fond and her findings in plain sight. She was very clear that UNDRIP Article 24, that as was uh, as Chief Don Tom said, Indigenous individuals have an equal right to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health. States shall take the necessary steps with a view to achieving progressively the full realization of this right. This is going to be really important to guide the future legislation on Indigenous health that Minister Miller is working on now. I remember how important it was during the summit on child welfare to underline Article 7 that details the collective and individual rights to live free from violence, including the phrase forcibly removing children, as it really guided the work to C92. So the, the proposed UNDRIP legislation provides for the development of an action plan that contains measures to deal with systemic discrimination against Indigenous people, including in our healthcare systems. It supports human rights education that advances mutual respect, understanding and good relations. And, and that's why it's so important that schools of every level of edu education across Canada work to teach students about Indigenous rights, the law, cultural humility, and safety. And we need to go further across all disciplines to engage youth and to ensure the understanding of Indigenous rights. But we know all Canadians truly need to know the truth. They will then be unable to unknow the truth. The recognition of Indigenous rights is not optional. It defines the future of Canada. And C-15 is a direct response to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission 43rd call to action, as well as the final report of the National Inquiry on Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls, reclaiming power in place. Canada's colonial and patriarchal history, together with the Indian Act and residential schools, represents the evil that can far too easily affect the vulnerable when rights are willful, willfully misunderstood or ignored. Ever since my time as Minister of State and Public Health and Paul Martin's government and the disappointment with the Conservative government's cancelling of the Kelowna Accord, my relationships with First Nations, Inuit and Métis have been transformational. They have totally changed my understanding of Canada and being Canadian. As the critic and now as Minister, I truly understand the amount of work that lies ahead as we try to right the wrongs and chart a path forward that recognizes Indigenous and treaty rights and transforms the relationship from paternalism to partnership with respect and cooperation. Your voices are essential, not only to Canada, but to help convince all Canadians right now that UNDRIP shouldn't be scary. Je suis optimiste, je pense que vous avons, nous avons fait des progrès. May Montrevail consists to accelerate la, la progression vers l'autodetermination pour réaliser la vision. J'ai vraiment hâte d'avoir cette conversation. In conclusion, I'm reminded of a quote by elder and knowledge keeper Maria Candel, Campbell, who called upon all of us to put our hearts and minds together to help us find in 2021 the courage and gentleness we need to move forward in building Mayo Me Secuno, a new road, a new way for our children, their children, and the seven generations to come. Uh, thank you, merci, merci, miigwech, nakumik, haichika. Thank you, Minister Bennett, and uh, for all of those words and drawing out uh, amongst all, all that you shared another theme, uh, which I think was really grounding the human rights aspect of the UN Declaration as an instrument and how to uphold and honor those dimensions of it and uh, the reality that colonization has not uh, impacted all Indigenous peoples in the same way, that there are distinct impacts that distinct groups and uh, peoples have experienced and that those have to be addressed specifically and not in some um, general way, and, and the UN Declaration draws that out.
And I'm sure that's a theme we'll continue to explore as well. Um, I do believe Minister Lametti, the Minister of Justice, is now with us, and some of the technical issues have been resolved. Wonderful. If uh, you, we're happy to have you, and if you could uh, please uh, share your 10-minute uh, remarks uh, with us, we're happy you uh, made it on. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Dinesh. Uh, Aisquale, hello, bonjour. Um, greetings from my office, which sits on the traditional territory of the Algonquin people. Apologies, first of all, for the technical difficulties. I'm not on my usual setup right here, uh, so I apologize for that. Um, and I don't have my headphones because I'm working off an iPad. The, I, my, my computer is increasingly having difficulties moving from Zoom to WebEx and back to Zoom again, and now it's decided that Zoom no longer works. Um, so I, I apologize for the change in order. I, I, I greet my fellow panelists. It's good, to, it's good to be with you all again virtually. And I'm pleased to join this panel on Bill C-15 on UNDRIP, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Uh, before I get started, I want to offer my best wishes to Grand Chief Stuart Phillip as he recovers from, from his uh, kidney transplant surgery. His family is asking for prayers and he is certainly in mine. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Dr. Mary Ellen Terpelafond Akikwe for your leadership, your legal expertise, and your tireless advocacy for Indigenous rights here in BC and throughout your career across Canada. Uh, I'm grateful to you and all the experts and leaders at the UBC Indian Residential School History and Dialogue Centre for your thoughtful Bill C-15 discussion paper. Soulève des enjeux importants et complexes que nous allons confronter ensemble. Dr. Trepelafon has provided a good overview to start us off. I would like to touch on some key points of the legislation uh, and place them in the context of the work we're doing to advance reconciliation. Bill C-15 is indeed about human rights. It's, it's a human rights document to me and, and an, important, uh, an important human rights document to me. It's about renewing and strengthening the relationship between the Crown and Indigenous peoples a relationship based on recognition, rights, respect, cooperation, and partnership. Une part important de notre travail est de faire avancer les priorités que nous partageons tous. Des priorités comme la formation de l'autogouvernance, diminuer les écarts socio-économiques, combattre la discrimination et éliminer les obstacles systémiques et le racisme systémique qui vivent les Premières Nations, les Inuits et les Métis. Many Canadian laws, policies, and programs already reflect elements of the Declaration. This includes Section 35 of the Constitution Act 1982 and many provisions of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, notably Section 15 on equality rights and the non-derogation provision in Section 25. It also includes the non-discrimination protections provided by the Canadian Human Rights Act. We have recently enacted laws referencing the Declaration in relation to Indigenous languages, Indigenous child and family services, and Indigenous participation in environmental impact assessments and other regulatory processes. So Bill C-15 is another important catalyst for this much needed work. We're on the right pathway together to making real and lasting changes. The bill has a strong foundation in Romeo Saganash's former bill C-262, a bill that was so close to the finish line before it died in the Senate. We developed Bill C-15 through collaboration and engagement, and we're still collaborating and engaging. That process hasn't, uh, hasn't stopped by any means. Working closely uh, with uh, leadership, Indigenous leadership, uh, beginning with national leadership of the Assembly of First Nations, Inuit Tapirit Kanatami, and the Métis National Council. We've also received input from other Indigenous leadership groups, notably the BC First Nations, who shared their experience with BC's own declaration legislation. We heard from modern treaty and self-governing nations, right holders, Indigenous youth, and national and regional Indigenous organizations, including those representing Indigenous women, two-spirited, and gender-diverse peoples. Those talks and, and consultations are continuing. We, we did table the bill in the House of Commons, but as we said from the beginning, uh, 
that would just be a way, a way station. We would continue uh, our outreach and we would continue to collaborate uh, with as many uh, leadership groups across Canada and as many nations as we possibly could speak to. And we held sessions with provincial and territorial governments and industry stakeholders, many of which included Indigenous experts and leaders. All of this has contributed to a stronger bill. It includes an enhanced preamble, including a recognition of inherent rights, an affirmation of the Declaration's application in Canadian law, including its relevance to interpreting the law, includes measures that will require the Government of Canada in consultation and cooperation with Indigenous peoples to align the laws of Canada with the Declaration. And it includes a more robust action plan and reporting process. The new preamble, I feel, is particularly important to advance reconciliation. It includes new language to highlight the positive contributions of the Declaration that the Declaration can make to healing and peace, as well as harmonious and cooperative relations in Canada. It includes new language to recognize the inherent rights of Indigenous peoples and language to reflect the importance of respecting truth, as well as language to highlight the connection between the Declaration and sustainable development and climate change. Finally, language to emphasize the importance of the diversity of Indigenous peoples in implementing uh, the legislation, uh, distinctions-based approach. It also expressly recognizes that provincial territorial and municipal governments have the ability to establish their own approaches to implement the declaration. We're ready to work with all levels of government, with Indigenous peoples and with other sectors of society to achieve the declaration's goals. We've also included a provision that says the act is to be understood as upholding the rights of Indigenous peoples recognized and affirmed by section 35 of the constitution and not as abrogating or derogating from them. Like similar non-derogation clauses in other federal legislation, this provision underscores that nothing in Bill C-15 reduces the constitutional protection of Aboriginal and treaty rights uh, that, that we, we had uh, previously. Drawing inspiration from BC's DRIPA, we used a purpose clause to affirm the declaration as a universal international human rights instrument with application in Canadian law. This means the human rights standards outlined in UNDRIP uh, can provide relevant and persuasive guidance to officials and courts. Together with First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples, we will develop and implement an action plan that will help us rebuild our relationships through the meaningful implementation of Aboriginal title and respect for treaty relationships. Together, we can move forward to a better, stronger future. It will include measures to address injustices, combat prejudice, and eliminate all forms of violence and systemic discrimination, and promote respect, mutual understanding, and good relations. It will address monitoring, oversight, recourse or remedy, and other accountability with respect to the implementation of the declaration. And it will provide for review and amendment of the action plan itself. So there's a lot of work to do here together before and after Royal Assent. This includes building a shared understanding of free prior and informed consent and how this would be interpreted in the Canadian context. It means having an open and honest dialogue about what this important concept means in practical terms and particularly confronting unfounded fears about its potential impacts. Events like today's are important contributing to that dialogue. We cannot delay the work to build the Canada that we want. Our government has pledged to address systemic racism and discrimination in all forms and to do so in a way that is informed by the lived experience of racialized communities and Indigenous peoples. Bill C-15 is another step along this path, as is the Indigenous Justice Strategy, which recently uh, was added to my mandate and which I'm, I'm proud to take on and anxious to take on in collaboration with, with all of you, with Indigenous leaders across Canada. I know there is a significant interest and expectations about the implementation of Bill C-15. Indigenous peoples are rightly calling for concrete timelines and firm assurances of meaningful change. I know that unwinding centuries of colonialism will take time, patience, and hard work, but it's hard work we have to do together. 
an open and respectful approach from all partners has helped lead us uh, to where we are today with C15. We must continue this approach as partners and friends through open and trusting dialogue. Trust is a profound word, one that all governments need to earn, particularly the federal government. I commit to you that I will do everything I can to act with urgency and with respect with our First Nations, with Inuit and with Métis partners, as well as my parliamentary colleagues, as we work together to develop and implement Bill C-15. The bill is not a fait accompli. Our government is open to suggestions to improve it. And as I said, we are continuing to listen and considering input from Indigenous partners about possible amendments. I'm always ready to have difficult conversations and I expect and hope for you to be candid and fearless as we push for passage of Bill C-15 through Parliament. Let the conversation continue. Hi Chica, thank you, merci. Thank you, Minister uh, Lametti, and uh, just noting your, your last remarks about the, the process the bill is going through and the issue of amendments, I'll just note uh, as foreshadowing that we do have various questions coming in about amendments, um, so we'll come to those shortly as the question and answer period starts. Um, but before that, we have our last speaker on this panel. Um, I note that uh, we are exactly on time at 1010. And uh, we have uh, National Chief Perry Bellegarde uh, of the Assembly of First Nations, who's going to provide his 10 minute perspective on Bill C-15, at which point we'll enter a question and answer period for about 20 to 30 minutes. So National Chief, happy you're with us today and look forward to your remarks. Thanks, Roshan. And uh, good morning to everyone. Good afternoon to everyone. Nista Nenaskamun, Kenanaskam Tenoa, Kakia no Temtik, Nista Koskatea Moskosis, Skonagan Utsinia, Egua Algonquins, Kenanaskam Tenoa, Egua Kiteak Shane Point, Kenanaskam Tin, Magagisimut, no Tainan Smantu. My relatives and friends just acknowledging uh, I'm in Algonquin territory here in Ottawa and I acknowledge them and thanking them as well. And saying I'm from uh, Little Black Bear First Nations, Treaty 4 territory, Southern Saskatchewan, and uh, acknowledging our elder, uh, Mr. Shane Point for his opening and thanking him for his prayer, his song, the rattle, and uh, the word, not so man, we are one, Co Salish, very powerful. Thank you for that. I want to acknowledge as well the Musqueam peoples for hosting the event in their territory. Uh, all the participants uh, attending online and our hosts, uh, UBC's Indian Residential School History and Dialogue Center. And I'm pleased to see and thank uh, Chief Don Tom, Minister Rankin, Minister Bennett, and Minister Lametti as well for their words. And as well, my prayers and thoughts go out for healing and strength to Grand Chief Stuart Phillip and his family uh, on their journey for healing and wellness. My message today is that transformational change can be mobilized and the promise of the United Nations Declaration can be realized. We've got the tools and the roadmap and we must continue our journey together. And as First Nations people, we've been advocating for change, not only here in Canada, but at the United Nations. So let's look at some of the things that have moved within that UN structure. We said the political space that First Nations occupy here at home and in the international human rights system continues to grow. We are starting to reassume our rightful place in the world as Indigenous peoples. And I've always said this, as Indigenous peoples, one of the most important rights we have is the right to self-determination. And we have the five elements, our own languages, our own lands, our own laws, our own identifiable forms of government and our own peoples, very important. And our right to self-determination under international law is now clearly affirmed by the United Nations Declaration. And we as indigenous peoples have actually changed the structure of the international human rights system. We have made dedicated space for indigenous peoples issues to be heard. We have worked collectively to successfully establish the Office of the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, the United Nations Expert Mechanism on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, 
and the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. And so we also continue our work to bring attention to the revitalization of our languages during this international decade of Indigenous languages. And we continue to press the United Nations to better reflect our international status as nations and peoples. Indigenous peoples' knowledge systems and worldview are increasingly recognized as valuable and relevant in a global context, whether it is dealing with the climate crisis, the pandemic, or the scourge of racism and gender-based violence and discrimination that exists. So at home here in Canada, we are working hard on what we're discussing today to put in place processes and mechanisms to ensure that federal and provincial laws and policies align with the fundamental rights of Indigenous peoples. And it's here that Bill C-15 and British Columbia's Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act hold so much potential to further elevate our joint work. And I'm really impressed with BC and how the First Nations and the government of BC work together to ensure passage of a provincial statute, the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act. And now you're working on its implementation. And I know that journey is complex and challenging, but you're doing what leadership must do. You persist, you're persevering to find those ways to work together. You persist in relationship building. You persist in your search for new ways to make decisions and to develop consent-based mechanisms. At the federal level, there are now several pieces of legislation and Minister Bennett referred to them. The Indigenous Languages Act, Bill C-91, and the Federal Child Welfare Act, Bill C-92, that incorporate references to the UN Declaration. And the courts are already using the declaration to interpret Canadian law. And that's what we must do. So we must all continue to press forward. The headlines we see week after week reporting the intolerate, intolerable incidents of anti-Indigenous racism in health services, in policing, the justice system, make this crystal clear that we need change. Canadians are beginning to understand what Indigenous people live every day. And at the AFN, we commissioned a poll last year, and a majority of Canadians agree that Canada needs to put on the human rights situation of Indigenous peoples. They need to act on it. 79% of Canadians identified First Nations issues as a priority. Almost two thirds of Canadians polled agreed that the government of Canada should pass federal legislation to implement the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And the same proportion expressed support for the concept of free, prior and informed consent. And so now we have Bill C-15. Where does it fit in this story of press, pressing forward with the change we need? C-15 is informed by the decades of work that I referred to at the beginning of my remarks. It affirms that respect and implementation of treaty and inherent rights is an integral part of Canada's international obligations. The depth of the preamble, for example, will do much to raise awareness and education on this point. Following 2019 filib filibuster of Bill C-262 in the Senate, and I thank Romeo Saganash for his leadership and his good work, our AFN was mandated by Chiefs and Assembly to pursue a government bill similar to Bill C-262 and build on that work. The AFN contributed to this process by assembling a team of legal experts that provided technical input during the federal engagement process as mandated by our AFN executive. We were to put in place a national team. So we brought in Willie Littlechild, Paul Joff, Mary Ellen Trapel lafon good work, Jennifer Preston, and internally we have Wendy Moss, Kayla Ben, and Will David helping this work proceed. Bill C-15 meets the direction set out in our resolution, our AFN resolution, 86-2019, to pursue a, a bill that is as strong or stronger than Bill C-262. It is a principal framework for moving forward. And if passed, it will launch action to effect change in an orderly, principled way. First Nations will continue to dialogue on how the bill can be improved. I'll highlight a couple of aspects of Bill C-15 that I'm, I'm 
I am particularly encouraged by the bill's clear rejection in its preamble of colonialism and quote, all doctrines, policies, and practices based on are advocating doctrines of cultural or racial superiority. To me, this necessarily includes the doctrines of discovery and terra nullius. So we've waited for over 500 years to see this. But if we need to make it clearer, my message is to the ministers here, let's do that. Let's make it clearer. C-15 will be an important tool in our struggle to end all forms of racism, whether overt, systemic, or intersectional in nature. The proposed Clause 6 speaks to this important work. It says the action plan to be developed cooperatively with Indigenous peoples must include measures to address injustices, combat prejudice, and eliminate all forms of violence and discrimination. It mentions systemic discrimination against Indigenous peoples and Indigenous elders, youth, children, women, men, persons with disabilities, and gender diverse persons and two-spirited persons. That is a welcome enhancement to Bill C-262. And I've been advised that the reference to all forms of discrimination would necessarily include racism. But if we need to make that clearer, we should make that get that done as well. We all want Canada to advance to a better place. And I am keenly aware that the federal declaration implementation legislation is not a panacea. It's not a magic bullet, but it is an urgent step towards unraveling racism and developing an orderly plan to bring Canada into compliance with the declaration. Implementation of the declaration cannot be achieved by legislation alone. A partnership cannot be imposed and decisions in a partnership cannot be made unilaterally. The work needs to happen on the ground. And in the words of Nobel Peace Prize laureate Rigoberta Menchu, the people are the only ones capable of transforming society. So what legislation can do is provide a principal framework to promote peace, security, well-being and respect for human dignity. It can all, C-15 can be a tool to facilitate harmonious and cooperative relations based on the principles of justice, democracy, respect for human rights, non-discrimination and good faith. Those are the words in the first preambular paragraph. And of course, any bill can be approved to meet its purpose. With indigenous people suffering from the daily reality of overt and systemic discrimination, there is a great urgency. We also live in a world of increasing political polarization and misinformation. We now face a troubling resurgence of white supremacist influence and all this while we combat a global pandemic. Dealing with systemic racism in justice, in health, in policing, in childcare requires systemic solutions and action. We can't afford to fight each other in the face of these threats. We all must strive together to thrive together. Living in fear of each other or in fear of change is not an option. I'm confident we will move forward to achieve the transformational change we all need and want. And I look forward to the discussion ahead. Thanks for listening. Great, thank you, National Chief. And uh, thank you for uh, returning us to where I think uh, Shane Point started us, which is with the, the spirit and intent and the focus of this work and why this work is being pursued uh, the way it is. Um, I want to uh, again thank all of our uh, five panelists and move us right into some uh, period of questions and answers for the next 20 or, or 30 minutes. Um, and uh, I've sort of, in looking at the questions, kind of organized them in, in three topic areas. One is about the process related to the bill and what has led us to this point. So National Chief, you touched on this uh, in your remarks a bit. Um, so I'm going to ask a question or two around that. We heard from Minister Rank in some more detail about the, the BC process, but it's uh, specific to the federal process. Then the second category I'd like to open some discussion about is uh, questions that have come forward about the meaning of aspects of the bill and what some of the intent is around some of it. And then the third set of questions or areas that I'd like to explore is, uh, again, it, you touched on it, National Chief, might be uh, issues that have been raised that aren't in the bill, amendments that might be proposed, sort of what the go forward looks like and what's uh, possible and being contemplated. 
So if that sounds like a, uh, a reasonable plan, the first uh, question again on the process, and I think this most properly goes to Minister Lametti and Minister Bennett, um, what consultation and accommodation was done with Indigenous groups, Indigenous peoples prior to the bill being drafted? And just to expound uh, on, on how the question was framed, I think it picked up some of the themes about trust and mistrust that uh, everyone has spoken uh, about this morning from Mary Ellen right through to, to Minister Lametti. So uh, either of you wish to start off on that question. Uh, thank you. I'm, I'm, happy to, I'm happy to jump in. Uh, as you know, we, we began uh, with a mandate. Uh, we had an election in the 2019 in which we, we said we would bring back uh, Romeo Saganash's bill as a floor. Um, and we knew that we had the support of the, the national indigenous organizations to begin with for that. And we came back in January, February and, and began to put that together. Um, but then COVID hit and we lost, uh, we lost some time there while we reorganized the way in which government works. What we decided to do in that, in that summer uh, was instead of tabling the legislation because we weren't having a regular House of Commons in the spring, uh, we began in early summer uh, reaching out, beginning with uh, the national indigenous uh, organizations and the leadership groups that they, the technical teams that they, that they, that they supplied and collaborated with. Um, and then we tried to reach out to as many, as many groups as we, we could, um, trying to identify sort of representative types. So, so uh, modern treaty holders, for example, uh, youth groups, women's groups, et cetera, uh, as best we could uh, with the intention of uh, developing as much as we could as possible, uh, but then with the intention of, of continuing uh, using the, the original plan was to use the legislative process as a consultative tool. Um, and so we're in the legislative process now, we tabled the legislation as you know, uh, in January. Um, and so we hope to continue uh, with that process. And I know that there are that there are leadership groups that we haven't been able uh, to get to yet, uh, but it is our intention to continue. It always has been. We thought it was more important to table the legislation and to have that process moving forward uh, than, than to wait until we could speak to everybody. And uh, again, the intention was to, was to use uh, Romeo's bill as a, as a, as a floor and to improve it as much as we could before tabling. And now we'll, we'll continue to try to improve it uh, during the parliamentary process. And then we'll continue, we think, we think it's an ongoing dialogue uh, and that will continue on through the implementation process and the development of an action plan. Great, thank you, Minister Lemony. Mr. Bennett, do you wanna add anything? No, I, I, I think Minister Lemetti captured uh, the fact that, that a lot of the engagement had happened on 262, uh, this wasn't starting from scratch, and that that there's a lot of interest now. Uh, I know in a conversation with Regional Chief Adamac in the Yukon, wants to do more herself, but also it will be um, the the real engagement on the the action plan will be, I think, really important for us to to develop in a in a meaningful way, such that everybody feels they've been heard, and that we will continue as we report back to Parliament um, the the progress or the need for changes. Great, and and uh, following up, I. Uh... I know Chief Don Tom uh, mentioned the BC leadership had had its own session around Bill C-15 yesterday, I believe, and there'll be some output from that. I don't know, National Chief, did you want to speak briefly to what may be coming up on the national stage? Mm -hmm. Sure. We have, um, well, we had our special chiefs assembly in December, and this Bill C-15 was on our chiefs meeting at that time. And uh, unfortunately, because we had so many things, items on our uh, our, our or send our agenda, we ran out of time for a full dialogue and discussion on C-15. So unfortunately it had to be cut short a little bit. And so now we've uh, passed the motion from our even executive to have a two day forum. So February 10 and 11 is a two day forum. Again, it's the education, the awareness, the dialogue, discussion, the who, what, where, when, and why, you know, and why is this important? You know, and there's been a lot of questions concerned uh, about the mandate, but our chiefs and assembly were, were very clear. 
uh, the only mandate that I was given as national chief was to try to get a bill as strong as Bill C-262, the private member's bill, and to work with this liberal government to ensure that that happens. And that's where Bill C-15 has come in. And um, again, that's that's why we're having this forum on, on uh, February 10 and 11. So it's going to be good. Um, we've always said that Bill C-15 is always, it's, it's there, but it's not perfect. So how do we make it better? How do we make it stronger? And I referenced a couple of ways that we could do that. Um, and I also said that it's been introduced for first reading. Uh, we can't rest until it's those two words, royal assent. So there's a lot of work to do and uh, we can improve that by working together. Okay. Just thank you, you, National Chief. Chief uh, Tom, you wanted to add something? Yeah, thank you, Roshan. Um, I know for us here in BC that uh, we want to ensure that the, the good work that we put into the DRIPA work that uh, uh, we can align and uh, that uh, the, the national uh, bill um, 15 would, uh, in many ways, ensure that it uh, complements and enhances uh, DRIPA uh, here in BC and ensure that uh, the things that we've worked hard for. But we're also uh, here in BC preparing for Senate committees and preparing for the ensuring that uh, at every available spot that uh, we have a voice here. And uh, it's uh, a lot of work to go ahead and ensuring that uh, laws policies are reformed and that uh, we see real change. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Chief Tom. Um, one more question. Uh, and of course, I can't uh, see anybody. So if I'm missing uh, one of the panelists who really wants to speak to a question I ask, uh, please just unmute and, and let me know. Um, but uh, one other process question, again, I think appropriately for Minister Lametti and Minister Bennett before moving into some substantive questions about the meaning of the bill. Um, question is how will the federal government or is the federal government addressing the reported issue that six of the provinces uh, have stated opposition to Bill C-15? Well, thank you. I, again, I'll, I'll, I'll take that question. Um, we, uh, we're obviously uh, working uh, with our, our provincial, uh, our provincial uh, counterparts uh, at a variety of different levels. I think, look, it, six, but that means uh, four plus, uh, plus at, at least a territory are, are very, one is already implementing BC, but it means others are either actively contemplating or generally favorable. So we, as, as the National Chief Belgard said, and, uh, and as Minister Bennett said, this was based on, on Romeo Saganash's bill, which has been around since 2016. We had flagged uh, at a federal, provincial, uh, territorial uh, justice uh, and, and public safety ministers meeting in Victoria in the beginning of, uh, of uh, 2020 that, that this was going to be uh, on our, our legislative agenda. Uh, the United Nations Declaration has been around for two decades. And so, there weren't any surprises in this bill, and I do think uh, I do think that with uh, your help, explaining the bill, with the help of British Columbia, explaining the bill, with the help of of a, a number of different industry groups, in, including the the oil and gas sector and CAP, um, they who have who have really understood uh, and embraced what this bill is about and what it's not about. Uh, I think we can we can bring those other provinces along. Um, British Columbia's example is positive, uh, and it 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 will be a, an example for other provinces. And I think as we move forward with C15 and the dialogue continues, uh, and as Canadians, non-Indigenous Canadians, begin to speak up and say this is an important uh, important path to reconciliation, that that we will uh, bring the other provinces along. Thank you, Minister Lametti. Minister Bennett, did you want to add anything? Only that, uh, only that, uh, you know, one of the provinces also wasn't keen on C92 either in terms of the rights of 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 uh, nations to look after their own children and to bring their youth home. So, uh, you know, I think it's a it's a a work, a unfinished work of confederation, as we say, that we move to better understand. Um, inherent rights and treaty rights and the fact that uh, Section 35 is not optional. 
Um, we've got years of of governments spending, you know, time and money to lose in court. So um, this is this is durable. Uh, we believe it's durable, and um, and and I think that that all of the things they're worried about, resource revenue sharing, all of those things that we we are we are ready um, to really. Um, explain uh, to Canadians about why the durable answer is recognizing Indigenous rights. It's, it's, it's the way forward and it's Canadians that we need on side as governments come and go. Perhaps, Roshan, I could jump in yeah. if that's okay. Sure, Minister Rankin, please. I, I, I just want to build on what Minister Bennett just said about explaining to Canadians. Uh, I extend my hand to the First Nation Leadership Council. If they would be willing to join with us, I think we could go as a province that has actually implemented it successfully, I think. Lots of work to do in, in implementation, no doubt. But to go to those provinces that are reluctant and say, we're fellow as fellow Canadians, we think we made a concrete step here. We think some of the fears that you have are not warranted. We had the same dialogue here and we, over, we overcame it. We also ended up having a lot of support from business leaders, et cetera. So I think we could give some comfort to those other provinces that are reluctant based on our experience, our collaboration, our cooperation. So I'm happy to uh, do my part uh, on that score. Thank you, Minister Rankin. Um, I mean, those questions uh, about process, I want to uh, shift a bit into some substantive questions. And I think this is for all of the, the panelists. And I think there may be a range of perspectives on this. But there's a set of questions, uh, and I'll just read one comment that to set it up. It says, passage of Bill C-15, C and we, we could have put the words, the Declaration Act in BC in there also does not in it itself implement UNDRIP. It sets up a process. And I think the process being referred to is the action plan as one process and whatever process would be built around the alignment of laws provision, which is section five in bill C-15 and section three in the BC bill. And I guess to turn it into more of a question is, um, um, do the panelists agree that these bills do not uh, it in itself implement UNDRIP, um, but rather set up processes. And so that would be the threshold question. Um, or if you do think it implements, how do you see it doing so? Um, so who wants to kick off that one? I guess I could if you like. Or... We have, we have. Go ahead, Murray, go ahead. All right. All right. Uh, well, I think it's it's fair to say that the key provision in, in the bill, from my point of view, is the action plan. But um, Mary Ellen Trapel Lafon made a really important point when she gave us the uh, overview that these action plans are required by the government. They must be prepared and they must be implemented. But the point she made was to achieve the objectives of the declaration. So going forward, we have a duty, a mandatory requirement on government in collaboration and cooperation with indigenous peoples to implement the, the objectives of the declaration, which are very broad and cover such a, the 46 articles cover an enormous swath of, of public policy. So that I think is true. It doesn't it therefore change it in the past, but gives us the requirement to make significant change in the future. So I think that is how I would start the dialogue. Thanks, Minister Aiken. Minister Lametti? Yeah, I'll add a, a slightly different riff on, on the same theme, which is at the very least, what the implementing legislation does is, it, is we accept the principles uh, and we accept the principles clearly. And we've given, we've given those principles additional um, context, if you will, in the preamble. Um, and so that becomes our roadmap. So it is moving forward. Yes, there's a process, there's an action plan. But already having accepted the principles, there's an impact. It has interpretive, uh, it has interpretive weight in the courts as a persuasive authority. Um, and it also has guided some legislation already and will even before the action plan gets finished, it, it is now there as a standard by which to interpret and judge all, all federal legislation moving forward, even before the action plan is actually implemented. So 
Um, yes, there's now a process moving forward. Yes, there's so many things we have to do better to, to dismantle colonialism. Um, but this is a this is a very important marker, and uh, it is it is about adopting uh, explicitly principles, and that's an important thing to do in the public space. Any other panelists, yeah. Minister Bennett, and the National uh, Chief? Go ahead, Minister Bennett. I'll go after you. Uh, no, I just wanted to. Uh, to just add one little thing, which is because the declaration is not a living document, I think that the process is important because of what we heard from the two-spirited and gender diverse people that is not in the declaration, but it is a principle um, that that we add on um, here in Canada. So it's, uh, um, I, I think the process and the respect is really um, how we, how we move forward um, based on principles, but always wanting to, to make it better. National Chief? Yeah, I would say on regarding the implementation piece, Bill C-15 itself doesn't implement the declaration, but requires steps to facilitate it. And um, you know, the, the, the act itself, it affirms that the declaration already has legal effect and application in Canada. So once it's passed, Bill C-50, there's a process now by getting the action plan developed, by looking at all federal laws. And I've always included policies as well to get in line with the UN declaration and the principles and everything that it contains therein. And then the annual reporting, like so it facilitates process already. It doesn't fully implement the declaration, but they, it, it's a process to get there. And then the other things that I wanted to stress earlier on, when you started talking about the provinces, we wanted to show the other six provinces that had this fear that there's nothing to fear. And we were using British Columbia again, and uh, and I did reach out to Premier Horgan and Minister Rankin to be part of our assembly in a couple of weeks, just to do that education awareness with those provinces that have a fear of it, that there's nothing to fear. In fact, it creates economic stability and economic certainty, and they just need to embrace that going forward. So I'll just, I'll add that much to this whole dialogue, that it doesn't implement the, the C-15, doesn't implement the declaration, but it provides the process and the framework to start working towards uh, the realization of Thank you. Um, anyone else on this question? I have a related question. Um, okay, please, Chief. Yeah, thank you. Um, just around the, the implementation, um, the rights of Indigenous people should not be subject to implementation only when those in political power agree to them. Um, this is fundamentally contrary to the United Nations Declaration itself. Uh, that's a position that we take uh, here at the union, and um, it, it's uh, uh, just wanted to share that. Thank you. Thank you. So just coming out of the, this whole set of comments, I'm just going to read a, a question out. I'm going to expand and broaden it a little bit. The question is, does the government of Canada, and I'm going to add the government of British Columbia here, appreciate and is it fully committed to the intent and promise of section five of the bill, um, which is the same as section three of the uh, provincial bill. This is the section that says uh, the government in consultation and cooperation with indigenous peoples will take all measures necessary to ensure the consistency of uh, the laws of Canada or BC as it may be with uh, the United Nations declaration. Um, as Dr. Tapalafond explains, Section 5 requires this consistency. If that consistency is to be achieved, it require a massive audit. This is the words in the question of all federal and, in the BC case, BC laws jointly and cooperatively. Uh, this is a major product uh, project. Is our governments uh, committed to the time, effort, and capacity that will be needed to accomplish this promise? Um, I leave it to BC or Canada who wishes to speak first to this one. Well, I'm happy to jump in first. Great. Uh, uh, I, look, I, I promise to do my best. Uh, I, I agree with, with that article uh, five and then in, in, in our legislation, I think it is, it does require in part a massive audit of what already exists. Uh, I agree with, with National Chief Belgar to say that includes policies and not just laws. And then as, I've, as I hinted in my last answer, it's also a filter for everything moving forward. Uh, as we move forward, anything new uh, needs to be uh, 
needs to pass through the lens of, uh, of UNDRIP and consistency with the principles that are in there. Um, it will take, it, this, is a, this is a process, it will take time to dismantle colonialism, uh, but this is a positive step forward. Uh, Minister Rankin. Yeah, I, I would agree exactly with what uh, Minister Lametti has just said. We also understand as the question indicated that this is a major project. I would say it's a gigantic project because we're talking about not only laws going forward. And when I say laws, I emphasize we're not talking just statutes. We're talking bills, I sorry, uh, regulations and other statutory instruments as well and all measures necessary, in some cases will require significant change to those laws in the, that are on the books now. Um, and that of course we, we are committed to doing by law in, in, in consultation and cooperation with indigenous uh, peoples. So that's a big task. I don't shy away from it. Yes, we acknowledge it is a major project uh, going uh, toward the, the past, if you will. Uh, I, I'm hoping uh, and expecting that the Leadership Council will help us, us prioritize those existing laws that are problematic from their perspective that we have to work on together. Because some of them, of course, will require significant amounts of work. Others will not require as much work, but that's absolutely the case. Going forward, we have the same responsibility as bills come into the legislature and so forth. Uh, and that, uh, is, that's a process that this new secretariat that I'm committed to, uh, required by my mandate letter to, uh, to work on, uh, will be addressing. So yeah, I think it's an excellent question and we accept the enormity of the task. Yeah. I mean, I would just add on, on this issue of the alignment of laws, uh, you know, it really speaks to two distinct sets of actions that are needed. One is what to do with new and upcoming laws and what's the process for uh, alignment in relation to those. And then what this question focused on this large project of which there's been some examples though, of course, in a different context, such as when the charter came into being of having to review and uh, reform uh, legal foundations. But even that is not a, an analog in many ways to, to this piece of work. And uh, I, I would just observe in the BC experience, given what we've seen in one legislative session so far, that there is a significant challenge to be lived up to on the first aspect, what to do with new uh, laws coming forward and what are the processes around that. Um, any other panelists want to speak to this question? If not, I'm going to move to some questions about amendments and going forward. So uh, one question, which again speaks to the relationship between uh, the BC law and the federal law, Bill C-15. There is some distinctions between the two laws. One, the main distinction that is pointed out, and I'm wondering, Chief Don Tom, you might want to start answering this by reflecting on whether it was raised in your all chiefs meeting yesterday, is the presence in the BC bill of uh, sections regarding free prior informed consent and namely the enabling provisions for agreements, consent-based decision-making agreements. To be clear, the BC bill doesn't define consent. It doesn't put restrictions or parameters around it. What it does is enable um, uh, it enables a process for entering into agreements to implement consent. We don't see any of those agreements yet. Um, but the question is, is there space for that in the federal bill? Is that something that's being discussed? Um, I don't know, Chief Don Tom, do you want to start that? And then maybe I'll turn to uh, the Minister of Justice and Crown Indigenous Relations. I think your mic may be off. We can't hear you. There you are. Sorry. Um, uh, yes, uh, we would like that. And uh, we would appreciate the tools in BC for DRIPA mm -hmm. and um, uh, that allow for sharing decision-making agreements. And uh, as we, uh, we see with uh, some of the work that uh, has been done in the Chilcotin and um, the impacts that it has had on their involvement in decision-making, um, there's a lot of, uh, uh, there's a lot of um, promise and uh, we definitely want those to be presented in the federal legislation as well. Thank you. Uh, Minister Lametti or Minister Bennett? Well, I'm happy to, we're, we're obviously watching carefully uh, what happens 
in British Columbia with their implementation process as we as as we move through our own legislative process and then have to uh, have to get to the action plan ourselves. Uh, and so we're open uh, to looking uh, to looking at, at at more robust uh, a more robust inclusion of uh, a definition of of FPIC or consent or other parts of that process. Um, but for the time being, we're open and we're watching and we're listening and we're in dialogue and we hope to uh, we hope to continue to move forward. I don't know if Minister Bennett has anything to add. No. Minister Rankin, do you want to speak about where BC is at in implementing specifically Section 7, the sure. consent Se provision? Section 7, as you, as you point out, Roshan, uh, uh, contemplates the ability to have joint decision-making uh, with Indigenous people, governing, governing bodies, joint decision-making which can either be uh, without consent or with consent in some circumstances. For uh, everything that is a statutory power of decision, which is how government uh, does business, if you will. And I'm really excited that we are working on, on the second category, the uh, consent-based decision-making, a couple of significant uh, arrangements with Indigenous peoples that are under um, discussion at a very uh, advanced level right now. Uh, and I'm hoping that we can show progress on that uh, by way of illustration going forward. So um, I find this, frankly, one of the more exciting aspects of the, of the work ahead of us. Thank you, Minister. Um, we're just uh, at the end of our time for this Q&A period. Um, and I know some of the uh, members of the panel do have obligations they have to move to. I do, before we close the question, answer and move to a, another panel, which will drill down on many of these topics from many expert perspectives. I just want to ask uh, Mary Ellen chapelle if she has any brief reflections on what she's heard so far this morning. Um, I would just like to say thank you as well to the um, panelists and that there have been a number of um, important issues discussed here. And again, it does come back to that issue around trust and mistrust and moving forward and how do we build it in um, my respectful view. And I've noticed a lot of the questions and comments during the session um, really do reflect this issue of um, um, we sometimes joke about it being like the peanuts column about Lucy and the football. We always get really worried that, you know, like Charlie Brown, just as we're about to get the football a kick, someone's going to lift it up. And um, I know Cheryl Casimir is also in our audience and she's been commenting today. And I remember when the DRIPL was introduced in the BC legislature, there's a lot of negative concerns and it took faith and trust that people could work together and go together. And Cheryl made that comment, which, you know, she, she took a very strong pause on the floor of the Legislative Assembly and say, do you hear that? The sky didn't fall. Um, and I think that was a really um, appropriate comment that day because people were like very afraid about the UN declaration. And a year in, there's work that's been done. But we do look to Canada's initiative with C15, and there is rightfully concerns. You know, we do need to have this dialogue. So I'm just appreciate the frankness of it. There are hard issues. We have to get through hard issues. And the disconnect between re uh, rhetoric and reality is something that Indigenous peoples are living with on the ground every day. So many of the people in the chat and attending today, you know, I think they are appreciating the dialogue, but they're also bearing a very heavy burden where some of these human rights principles and values are not actioned on the ground. So we will carry that thought forward. And I know we'll hear from our panelists more on that, but I really wanna thank our political panelists as well for their thoughtful contributions and to advance the dialogue today. Great. Thank you, Mary Ellen. And thank you again to all of uh, everyone on that panel, all of your leadership and all of your comments and reflections. I think it was uh, very enlightening for everyone who was watching and most appreciative, um, so thank you. Um, we're gonna carry on, uh, and I just want to acknowledge as well that um, you know many, many questions have come in. I only got to a fraction of them. I'm gonna to return to many of them with the next panel, and we're also gonna find some ways to follow up uh, otherwise to get question, uh, answers to some of these questions. So uh, again, thank you uh, to that panel. And now we'll move on to a panel of experts um, who are gonna provide again, a whole number of lenses and perspectives on Bill C-15. Um, we have five, uh, five uh, speakers again.
um, all coming from different uh, vantage points or formats the same. Each of them will speak for about 10 minutes and then we'll have another 20 to 30 minute question and answer period. Um, so please keep posting those uh, questions as we move along. I will also note that two of our speakers, uh, Jessica Wood is uh, Assistant Deputy Minister uh, in, in Ministry of Indigenous uh, Relations in, for British Columbia, and Laurie Sargent, who's Assistant Deputy Minister at the uh, Department of Justice in Canada, are two of the speakers. And in addition to their own comments and observations, uh, they also can uh, uh, respond to some of the questions that are specific to the respective governments about where things are at or what's being implemented. So we're grateful that they're uh, able to be with us today. Um, so having said all of that, our uh, first speaker is uh, Quil Quilosselton, uh, Doug White from the Sunamo First Nation, also the chair of the uh, BC First Nations Justice Council. And uh, we'll ask Doug to uh, uh, kick off this panel for us. Thank you, Roshan. Asiam Nasiaya, Ain't the Pequil Osselton, Tanis Nanemo, Ain't Nashqualuan Konas Ih I, Haitseka, Haitseka, Siam Mestimo. I want to begin by uh, thanking the hosts for the invitation to share a few thoughts of this important moment in the development of our country's history and the relations between the state and Indigenous peoples. I thank my uncle Shane Point for his opening. A prayer and song. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit over the course of the, I think about about 10 minutes, I'm going to talk about some of the background history that I think is very important to reflect upon and then try to get to the specific comments about Bill C-15 as quick as I can. Uh, for over, well over a century, our people have been standing up to advocate for two basic uh, propositions. That is that Indigenous peoples in this country have the right to self-determination and that Indigenous peoples have the right to Aboriginal title and for the special relationship that they have with their territories to be respected. That is, the, that is what we have always advocated for. That is the essence of our work, that generations, multiple generations of Indigenous leadership have spent their lives seeking to advance uh, in this country. I think about the work of the Coast Salish uh, Committee of Chiefs in the 1800s that did so. I think about the Nishka Land Committee going back into the 19th century that articulated so powerfully their own uh, perspectives and their own approach to their laws uh, and their relationship to their territories. What people that come to mind for me at this kind of a moment are the great leaders, Andy Paul from Squamish, Peter Kelly from the Haida people that lived here in Nanaimo, it's the Nanaimo territory. Their work in continuing in the early 20th century, that's that same advocacy through the allied uh, Indian tribes of British Columbia. Their work uh, effectively culminated when they went to the, uh, the, the special joint committee back in Ottawa in 1927, uh, the door was slammed shut in a major way that led to the deepest part of uh, denial of indigenous rights, the right to self-determination, Aboriginal title, the need for indigenous peoples in the crown to work together to craft a right relationship. Uh, we know uh, that was a grim period from 27 through into the 50s and into the 60s. Uh, another important person that comes to mind for me today is George Manuel, the great Shuswap leader. Someone who was an incredible visionary someone who had the capacity to bring Indigenous peoples together, not just in British Columbia and not just in Canada, uh, but around the world. It's almost 50 years ago now. It's almost half a century ago in 1975 here on Vancouver Island at Port Alberni, Tsushat. The Tsushat people hosted the first uh, World Conference of Indigenous Peoples. That was an organization that George Manuel 
brought into being. And it's very specific focus and, it, and, and its work was about the need for representation of indigenous peoples at the United Nations, uh, the need for the preservation of cultural integrity and continuity, and the retention of land and natural resources of, of, of indigenous peoples. The vision that they set out at that time period at that conference a very long time ago, half a century ago, uh, continued to be, uh, it, it is the stuff that we continue to talk about today. And so I didn't want to go uh, into discussing Bill C-15 without acknowledging and talking about that history and what our advocacy is about, where it comes from. Uh, how we were raised and what we were uh, told to focus upon, the mandate that we have from our ancestors to do this work in this time. So I want to, you know, the, the UN Declaration is a direct outcome from that work that George Manuel and other leaders from around the planet uh, began so long ago. I want to talk a little bit about what I think is so essential and important about the UN Declaration, just quickly. It is very firmly rooted in both a self-determination model and a human rights model. It's a combination of those two very important principles, both of decolonization and of equality. And so we can't just talk about it in terms of human rights. It's more than just mere human rights. It was born out of indigenous rights as well, and specifically the right of self-determination. I think that's important to reflect upon and to be, to have in the front of our minds. Uh, at its core, the UN Declaration is about self-determination of indigenous peoples. And because indigenous peoples are self-determining, because there's a recognition that Indigenous peoples have a say, that they have authority, that they have jurisdiction and decision-making power, the necessary outcome or corollary of that is the idea of consent. That is where consent comes from. Consent doesn't stand by itself. Consent is born out of the reality that Indigenous peoples have a say that they have jurisdiction and decision-making power. Uh, another major element of the UN Declaration, of course, is, the, is land rights and the need for indigenous peoples to have the proper relationship, ownership, control over their lands. It's a very, uh, these are, those are the two things that we have been fighting for for well over a century that we have been advocating for. Uh, there's also, um, I think there's a very important idea in or more than an idea set of uh, articles that talk about the idea of redress. This is a, something that I don't think gets enough attention in the UN Declaration. The redress is a very powerful concept and very powerful principle that makes clear that should uh, any state proceed in a way without the consent of indigenous peoples to take decisions that would impact upon them, that redress must be uh, dealt with. So that's a powerful uh, sort of shift. I, I wanna, you know, so the UN declaration was 2007. That's a long time ago already when it was articulated. Uh, Canada, uh, didn't fully sign on, of course, until 2016, which is still, that's some time ago now. Very, uh, I want to acknowledge too the work of Romeo Saganash in putting forward Bill uh, C-262 a number of years back. Um, that's, a, that's a bill that should have happened. It should have taken place. It should have been supported. Now, in terms of Bill C-15, where we're at today, I, I want to talk, you know, obviously heard today the importance and how critical it is, the process of lawmaking in this country on issues that affect us and how we need to be involved in that work. 
Uh, we're obviously not in a place of anything remotely like perfection on that. We've heard questions about it. This is something that we've got to figure out. And I expect that this is something we would figure out through the kinds of discussions uh, around the consistency provision about the, the work and the mandate of aligning the laws of Canada with the UN Declaration. I mean, I would remind people too that the, the laws of Canada are not just limited to legislation and policy. It also, the laws of Canada include the Constitution of Canada. And these are really, when we're talking about uh, the matters, the subject matter of Indigenous people's self-determination and land rights and the relationship with Canada, these are definitely constitutional matters about the clarifying and making sure that the proper arrangements and, and, and space is created for the, the manifestation of Indigenous self-determination and land rights. Um, in terms of some other, uh, the substance of the uh, Bill C-15 itself, I mean, I would, in my last uh, minute or so of time, I, you know, I would, if we're talking about simple amendments and heard from Minister Lametti that they want to hear about possible amendments, I would talk about uh, maybe shifting uh, the purpose statement that talks about the application of UNDRIP in Canadian law out of a purpose and into a straightforward provision. Um, I don't, you know, I, you know, purpose statements can sometimes be a little more, uh, they can fall on the interpretive side about the rest of the legislation instead of being uh, per, a, substan a substantive provision themselves. Um, consistency provision around the, the this is going to be major, you know, we're, we're going to have to have major discussions as Indigenous peoples in, in Canada about how to engage in that work and how to prioritize that work and how to make sure that we uh, get that work right. Um, same too with the action plan. Um, I would like to see a consent uh, agreement provision in this bill uh, analogous to the BC uh, DRIPA Act. Uh, if there's ways for us to start to bridge the gaps sooner rather than later and create opportunities for Indigenous peoples in the Crown to operate in a paradigm of consent, uh, then I think that makes sense for, for us to do. So uh, other, of course, there's um, there's a lot of new kind of infrastructure that I think will be required, new legislation. Uh, we need to think too about the kinds of mechanisms that we will need that need to be supported to undertake this uh, enormous task. So uh, I think I'm about a minute over, Roshan, I'm gonna stop there and uh, thank everyone for an opportunity to share a few thoughts on this important issue. I'd say it because see them. Thank you, Doug. And thanks in particular for setting, uh, situating this dialogue in some uh, broader context, particularly the advocacy by Indigenous peoples, generation over generation, uh, that brings uh, us to this point and many points to come. Um, in terms of the, your last set of comments about uh, amendments, changes, suggestions, uh, that of course was where we left off with the last uh, set of questions, and I'm sure we'll be picking it up again in the, in the question and answer, so you can expand on some of those thoughts there. Um, I'd like to uh, now transition to our next presenter, Jessica Wood, who uh, is uh, both an Assistant Deputy Minister for BC in the Ministry of Indigenous Relations and a uh, Policy Practitioner Fellow at uh, UBC. And uh, welcome, Jessica. We look forward to your remarks. Amasai. Um, Sisek Yelk, Stebayu, Simgiget, Sivikam Hanak, Ganguba Wilkesuk. My name is Cece Yelks, a uh, small gag for a woman who creates change, and I'm very honored to be here with Dr. Tapella Fond, uh, Dr. Roshan Dinesh, as, as well as um, uh, Elder Shane Point and getting started in a good way. Um, I wanna thank the, the Indian Residential School History and Dialogue Center for hosting us here today and for carrying on the incredible work of survivors that have led us to this moment and recognizing the importance of, of the scholarly and, and governmental and legislative exercise around UNDRIP to advance both the, the inherent rights of Indigenous people, but also the recommendations coming out of the TRC calls to action. And I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge uh, 
these uncertain times and all of the indigenous communities and leadership that are struggling to continue to keep their eye on the advancement of, of indigenous rights during a global pandemic and appreciate everybody who's made time today and acknowledge those who are, who are not well. Um, I, wanted, I wanted to take some time today to focus on some of the key components and the learnings that we've gained from the development, introduction, passing and subsequent efforts to implement the UN Declaration through the Declaration Act here in BC. Um, I had the honor of being the instructing officer, but working in deep collaboration with uh, political leadership from, from Indigenous nations here in BC, as well as their, their legal counsel and subject matter experts, legal experts from uh, Indigenous scholarly institutions and practice from across the province, some of whom are in involved in the development of the UN Declaration itself. There's a long legal tradition of participation on the global stage for the advancement of Indigenous rights here in BC, and that's what's made all of this possible. Um, what I would say is, is through those efforts and, and having that unanimous support from all sides of the House gives some indication of the timeliness of this work and the readiness of us as a nation state and as a province uh, to be able to take on that work at this time. I would say that the most important parts of that that initial exercise is the, the, the direction of our political leadership within, within the province of British Columbia to move the exercise of reconciliation from a platform commitment to a legal imperative. And that in itself means that we can bring some consistency to, to the application and to give the structure of the UN Declaration to that exercise is um, so important because now it's no longer dependent on who is in an elected leadership position, but actually on the exercise of us as a society, as public servants, as nations, uh, to do that advancement collectively and together. It does something really powerful and it signals, um, it makes uh, in that action, it, it goes from being a virtue signal to an actual foundational piece of our legislative uh, our legislative landscape and particularly in that it recognizes uh, legal pluralism and that the indigenous legal traditions of recognizing our own inherent rights and humanity are now part of the provincial legal landscape in our legislation and affirmed as such and that the onus is now on the province of British Columbia to work in consultation and cooperation with indigenous peoples to ensure that that's reflected in our laws, policies and practices. Those objectives being stated as not being a uh, a political uh, mandate, but as, a, as an exercise of the law is transformative. It changes everything that follows. That doesn't inoculate us from having to do the work. It didn't, as, as we heard, um, it didn't change anything overnight, but it intends to change things over time. And that's the process that put in place and put the onus on the province to do the work and to do so in collaboration, which is unique in, in our confederation. But to do this work, um, collaboration, trust, integrity, and transparency are key elements to advance this work. And that was demonstrated uh, in how the, the bill was actually successfully introduced, debated, and passed. We were able to work uh, within a, a construct here in the province where we prioritize uh, parliamentary privilege and secrecy. Whereas the nations that we are working with uh, prioritize transparency and consensus building. And bringing those two things together really stretched the provincial um, processes around legislative development and the trust and uh, uh, faith of indigenous nations, not only in our relationship, but in the leaders that were then invited into uh, an imperfect and closed door process. So I wanna acknowledge some of the challenges and how we have to develop legislation and what we can learn from that and what we will need to learn from that in the process going forward and the accountabilities that we've, we've given ourselves as a province. I would be remiss to say that uh, this wasn't all just uh, our idea and that we didn't have the benefit of learning from some of the efforts of the federal government. We started by uh, adopting our own version uh, called the Draft 10 Principles that was largely based on the federal 10 Principles um, 
I would say that we also incorporated some language around indigenous governing bodies that is already present in federal legislation. And so this leadership and this leadership from indigenous uh, people that have manifested in other forms we've learned from and we've incorporated into our legislation. Um, while we were able to, to build on those pieces, we also had to look at some tools here in British Columbia. We have been at the center point of 25 years of, of legal challenge and uh, jurisprudence around Indigenous rights. And we have here everything, Haida decision, Dalgamuk, Chilcotin, the list goes on and we need to find other ways here that the onus is on the province to find further tools to work with Indigenous people as partners and recognize those rights to work towards title and to, to acknowledge the inherent rights of Indigenous people in the province. To do that meant that we needed to add other tools. The first, as I've mentioned, is just creating a space. Um, in our legislation, it was important to have a, a section around Indigenous governing bodies to support and affirm the space for those nations as they choose to self-determine their governance to be able to enter into agreement with the province. The second, as, as uh, Doug mentioned, was around shared decision-making and Minister Rankin mentioned, and we have really good tools about how we share recommendations to statutory decision-makers. We have tools for delegating authority, but we take up all the jurisdictional space. And then we have tools through treaty to recognize jurisdiction, but we haven't had any tools about how those jurisdictions uh, intersect and how we can make decisions together. And that is an incredibly important part of our legislation. So those two things I'll, I'll bring to the attention of uh, Made in BC opportunities that are really intended to advance um, significant opportunity and everything from scholarly to legal advancement here in the province. Um, and what I'll say is, as it connects to C15, the things that I'd like to highlight is we have for the first time um, in our province, any affirmative legislation that affirms the humanity of indigenous people, that affirms that that humanity comes with it a set of rights and that those rights have meaning. We haven't had any provincial law that holistically looks at that. We've had references to consent in our new environmental assessment act, but we haven't actually until this moment tackled the affirmation of what is contained within section 35 and we have done a few things to to make sure that we are not overstepping for indigenous people their positionality and legal traditions as well you'll notice in our law uh, we have an interpretation section it was not the role of the province to define an indigenous governing body for instance that is the role of indigenous nations and we need to create space and be responsive to that but the piece that we have that is congruent with C15 with the action plans and the alignment of laws, imagine the potential now, should this law C15 actually be successful at getting through the House and the Senate, that we will be able to do the largest full scale transformation led out of BC and nationally that actually affirms the humanity of indigenous people in law. We can amplify if we work together and I will leave this as my final comment. Should the federal government be interested in in making significant progress and implementation of their bill, then amplifying the efforts that we have in our action plan and the interests that are identified by nations here in British Columbia. We'll do a, a full sale regard uh, advancement if, our, if that exercise is uh, jointly amplified. So I'll leave it there and look forward to comments and questions. Great. Thank you, Jessica. Thanks uh, in particular for uh, uh, building on the comments of Minister Rankin uh, earlier this morning and, and providing some more detail about what BC is uh, doing, where they're at in terms of the implementation of the bill. Um, it is the only uh, example so far uh, across the country of implementing this type of legislation. And I think lessons that can be taken from it uh, are vitally important. Um, just moving along, our next uh, presenter is uh, Dr. Cheryl Lightfoot, uh, Canada Research Chair of Global Indigenous Rights and Politics and the Senior Advisor to the President on Indigenous Affairs uh, at UBC. And uh, we're very happy that she's joined us uh, here to provide some remarks. So Cheryl, please. Uh, 
Thank you, Roshan. Um, and wel uh, welcome to our discussion, everyone, today. Um, I'm joining you uh, virtually from my home on the UBC campus, which, of course, is located on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. And always, I have to stop and express my appreciation for Musqueam hospitality, generosity, and friendship to those of us at UBC. And special thanks to Elder Shane Point for your opening remarks this morning. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm Anishinaabe, and my home territory is Lake Superior. So I am a long way from home here at UBC. And I've been here in British Columbia for about 12 years. And in my view, that makes me still quite a newcomer here. Um, so I came here as a political scientist by training. Uh, but my specialty is in Indigenous human rights and especially their implementation from a global human rights perspective and especially from a UN perspective. So I want to thank my distinguished co-panelists and also express my appreciation to the dialogues us for this invitation. I want to offer some thoughts. Uh, okay, it says my internet connection is unstable, so I hope I, I'm staying with you. Um, I run into trouble whenever my camera's on because there are three of us in the house on Zoom at the same time. So uh, hopefully I, I stay with you, but I'm just giving you a warning. Uh, my comments are, are coming from a global human rights perspective and how this legislation responds to a very particular and clear set of recommendations and expectations coming from the internet international human rights system. And in some ways, my comments will build upon and add to those of the national chief in the first session and also Doug White uh, in this session. While we're certainly all aware, and it's been a point of discussion often, that uh, the TRC has called uh, within Canada to implement the declaration at all levels of government, in my 10 minutes, I want to walk you through a few of the calls that are less known, uh, but are coming from the United Nations and other human rights treaty bodies. They are directed at all UN member states, which of course includes Canada, on the need for legislation as a key element of an implementation plan. And I also want to draw attention to a few of the calls for implementation legislation that have been specifically directed to Canada. A 2017 report by the Human Rights Council by to the Human Rights Council by the UN Expert Mechanism on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples noted that the declaration informs the work of many global actors and has influenced the drafting of a multitude of new state constitutions and statutes, and it's contributed to the development of laws and policies pertaining to Indigenous peoples around the world. And from a human rights perspective, implementation of indigenous human rights in domestic settings is expected to be comprehensive and systematic and has always been expected to include judicial policy reform. And most importantly for this conversation, legislative avenues. And the understanding is that all of these measures together create a synergy which leads to full implementation of indigenous human rights. And a national legislative framework that includes mandates for a review of existing laws and policies, includes a national action plan, annual reporting mechanism, and a complaints mechanism have all been noted by multiple human rights mechanisms as a powerful first step, first step towards full implementation of the declaration. And if we look to the the text of the declaration itself, we find the need for legislation. Article 38 states that states, meaning UN member states, in consultation and cooperation with Indigenous peoples shall take the appropriate measures, including legislative measures, to achieve the ends of this declaration. Former UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, the late Rodolfo Stavenhagen, wrote in 2009, the rights in the declaration can be seen as a framework of reference, a point of departure leading perhaps among other things to new legislation, to a different kind of judicial practice, to institutional build, institution building, and also wherever necessary to a different political culture 
He described it as a process of localization which occurs when global standards like the UN Declaration influence and contribute to important changes in national and local level political processes. And it is precisely at the regional and country levels, he says, that the rights on the Declaration must be made to apply. In 2017, the UN Expert Mechanism on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, or MRIP, prepared a 10-year report on UN Declaration implementation progress. And they noted that the member states, that means the national level, have the principal responsibility for adopting legislative measures and public policies to implement the Declaration as a part of their ongoing human rights obligations. Further, a handbook for parliamentarians on implementing the UN Declaration published by a number of UN agencies, cites the lawmaking role of parliaments as of particular importance in implementing the declaration. And this handbook suggests that legislative review and reform are essential first steps in implementation efforts, and that all future national legislation should be evaluated for compliance with the UN declaration as an ordinary part of the legislative process. A similar manual for national human rights institutions states that national legislation is also an important first step toward domestic implementation, but legislation alone is generally not sufficient, and so national action plans must also be developed that include legislation, a review of existing laws and policies and other measures. If we look with a global comparative lens, we see a couple early cases. And in November 2007, with the declaration only two months old, Bolivia was the first country in the world to embrace a legislative approach with law 3760, which integrated the declaration into domestic legislation. A few years later in 2011, the Republic of Congo passed Act Number 5-2011 on the promotion and protection of the rights of indigenous peoples. Now, if we turn to Canada, we see a number of specific directions from the human rights system to Canada, and I wanna highlight those. In Canada's most recent universal periodic review by the UN Human Rights Council in 2018, many calls and recommendations were directed at Canada's need to combat discrimination against Indigenous peoples and build in better mechanisms to protect Indigenous peoples' human rights. And several of these calls included specific recommendations to strengthen legislative frameworks and their institutional foundations. While the report on Canada recognized that progress is certainly being made, notable gaps remain that must be addressed by legislative reform as one of the key recommendations. The report expressed support for the earlier bill C-262, which it said aims to ensure consistency between domestic law and UNDRIP and builds on other measures Canada has taken to implement the declaration. In September 2017, the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, or what's known for short as CERD, this is the monitoring body for the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. It conducted its periodic review of Canada. And as the signatory of this convention, Canada is legally bound to be reviewed and is required to respond to each of the concerns raised by the CERD. And the CERD report applauded the government's commitment to implement the TRC calls to action, but mentioned that the CERD is very concerned about the lack of an action plan and a full implementation of the declaration. And the CERD recommended that Canada develop in consultation with Indigenous peoples, a concrete action plan to implement the TRC's calls and that it implement the UN declaration through a legislative framework along with national action plan reporting and review. And in December of 2019, CERD issue, issued a letter directly to Canada concerning allegations of violations of Indigenous people's rights, in particular, the absence of free prior and informed consent. And in November 2020, just a couple months ago, after receiving Canada's formal response, 
the CERD issued a nearly unheard of follow-up letter to Canada indicating that its responses to date concerning those allegations are not adequate. And CERD appreciates that national le legislation to implement the declaration has been proposed and they have asked for another update uh, and follow-up on the status of the adoption of this legislation. So just to conclude this very brief walk through the UN and other international bodies, including treaty bodies, shows us that this, this, this legislation on the national level is unquestionably expected as part of an entire suite of implementation measures. And in fact, legislation plays a key role in implementation. And if we look closer to Canada, we can see that the UN fully expects Canada to pass legislation as part of this ambitious program of reforms and to do so without delay. And so I will end there and pass on to the next panelist. Back to you, Roshan. Great, thank you, Dr. Lightfoot. And in particular, thank you for grounding uh, the discussion more in the ongoing work uh, internationally, uh, uh, certainly uh, uh, in recent years and since 2007 and what uh, those bodies have had to say and that work has had to say about the progress in Canada. Um, just to foreshadow where some of our questions and Q and A's are going to be coming, there's many substantive issues being raised around, uh, uh, and some of this dovetails to what Dr. Lightfoot was just talking about. Uh, what other legislation is needed? What should that legislation focus on? There's questions around consent and whether some of this legislation should explicitly address consent. We had some of that discussion in the first panel. Um, there's also questions around uh, historic treaty implementation and whether uh, these bills and UNDRIP facilitates that. So we'll be getting into those questions as we uh, move into the Q&A, but we have two more uh, panelists first. Um, our next one is Professor Brad Morse, uh, who's uh, Faculty of Law at Thompson Rivers uh, University. Professor Morse. A white to white up, Brad Morrison's quest. I've got the pleasure to be speaking to you from Sequemakulu, which is the traditional and unceded territory of the Sequemak Nation or Shishwap Nation. Uh, I also want to thank, as others have before me, Musqueam Elder uh, Shane Point for his warm welcome to his traditional territory, his song and his wide, wise words. Uh, thank uh, Dr. Roshan Dinesh for his job moderating and, and Dr. Mary Ellen Tapella Fund, uh, Aki Kwe for her kind invitation to me to participate and thanks to the Indian Residential School History and Dialogue Center uh, as our host. Um, let me kind of uh, leap in on uh, making some points. Uh, one of the things as uh, Mary Ellen and Chief Tom and Minister Rankin and Jessica Wood have all noted, uh, the BC DRIPA, uh, BC's legislation on UNDRIP was passed unanimously. And I really wanna stress that because I think that's a vital point uh, because it means all parties support, all three parties in the house supported this legislation, uh, an active effort being able to reach out to the uh, the broad community of British Columbians, individuals, as well as nonprofits and for-profit corporations, et cetera, to make clear that there was a groundswell of support for this, not just in the legislatures, but across the province. And uh, that's in marked contrast to what happened with Bill 262. Uh, and that was also mentioned uh, uh, very briefly by uh, uh, Minister Lametti. Uh, it, there's a challenge here in Parliament, and I hope that it manages to match the spirit within the BC legislature. Uh, Bill C-15, if it passes unanimously, would have a profoundly greater significance uh, for Canadians who are concerned about it, because they would see that there's active opposition in Parliament, for civil servants who might fear that when there's a change in government, that the bill would be repealed. It weakens uh, the mandate really that exists there and leaves exposed that there is a rift uh, among uh, Canadians and at least was the case uh, in the past when Bill C-262 went forward uh, among political parties in parliament. And I think it's important that, that if at all possible, we try and dampen that kind of sense of discord within parliament. Uh, we also heard about BC having a requirement for an 
for an annual report. And it managed to do that. Uh, it's a relatively short report because there were less than four months of the uh, really of the fiscal or just over four months of the fiscal year from Royal Assent being issued on November 19th of 2019, as I recall, to March 31, 2020. They got the report out by June of uh, 2020. And despite only covering four months, it still managed to achieve quite a bit. And now we've heard even further from Minister Rankin and Jessica Wood about further activities. So we expect uh, a new report uh, certainly after the end of this fiscal year. Uh, the process to create C C15 obviously is influenced both by C262, Romeo Saganash's uh, a major achievement in getting it through the House, albeit not through the Senate, uh, due to conservative party opposition. But it does, uh, it's also C15 has been influenced very much by, by BC DRIPA. And we would hope that other provincial governments would uh, adopt that approach as well. Uh, the mandate, uh, as Minister Lametti indicated, his most recent mandate letter of just over two weeks ago from Prime Minister Trudeau uh, identified passage of C-15 as a priority issue for he and Minister Bennett, as well as giving Minister Lametti lead on the Indigenous justice strategy, which is, quote, in cooperation with provinces, territories, and Indigenous partners to address systemic discrimination and overrepresentation of the justice system. That's really directly quoting some of the language from the, uh, the bill C-15. So we can see that C-15 is perhaps already having an influence merely by being tabled in parliament on the acting, on the thinking of government. C-15 obviously has a much stronger preamble than 262, but uh, uh, Romeo Saganash's bill was a private member's bill and that limited the scope of what that bill could seek to achieve. Uh, it draws upon the preambles, as was mentioned, in terms of the Indigenous Languages Act and the Act for First Nations, Inuit, Métis, Children, Youth, and Families Act, C91 and C92. So the government has, to some extent, been moving on its commitments on UNDRIP by sprinkling it in some other legislation. But C15 is really what we've been waiting for since of Prime Minister Trudeau's commitment uh, in the campaign and then upon his election in 2015, that this would be a priority issue. So the preamble, uh, as been mentioned, concludes 22 paragraphs. It's a particularly long uh, list of preambles as far as uh, federal legislation goes. Many of them include very significant language. They are in the preamble, that's true. They're not in the substance of the bill, but nevertheless, by virtue of being in the preamble, they will be part of an interpretive guide on the legislation. And they're clearly going to give uh, messages of instructions to how uh, the uh, bill should be interpreted and in particular, how the national action plan should be developed. Uh, the paragraphs constitute really an official statement uh, from the Parliament of Canada, assuming it's passed, that completely contradicts what Canadian history has generally demonstrated, uh, such as paragraph seven, which talks about Indigenous peoples have suffered historic injustices as a result of, mother, of, among other things, colonization and dispossession of their lands, territories, and resources, including racism ex explicitly, and here racial discrimination would strengthen the paragraph further, uh, and it's the dispossession occurred largely, of course, of the desire to, to take or steal or possess indigenous lands, uh, often without their consent. Uh, there are other strong clauses in the preamble about implementing the declaration must include concrete measures to inge address injustices, combat prejudice, and eliminate all forms of violence and discrimination, including systemic discrimination. That picks up on Dr. Lightfoot's point about the human rights aspect in particular of the UN, of UNDRIP itself, uh, but also in this bill. And, uh, and the government formally rejects all forms of colonialism and is committed to advancing relations with indigenous peoples that are based on good faith and on the principles of justice, democracy, equality, non-discrimination, good governance and respect for human rights. That's really the first statement at that level 
that we've seen from the federal government that ever appear in any legislation that I can think of. So it does uh, really make some bold statements, the kinds of statements that we sometimes hear in speeches in parliament, but we don't see reflected in legislation. Are there some weaknesses? Sure. Uh, the action plan does not require any, uh, any action to recognize indigenous laws or self-determination. The preamble talks about uh, self-determination, but it's not formally included as, as items that must be addressed within the action plan. The action plan is to provide a framework for the government of Canada's implementation of the declaration. The framework suggests that it's a road to future implementation, but doesn't really commit to any immediate actions uh, on or steps along those loads. It sets a time limit for three years to achieve the plan. But the clock only begins to run after, quote, after the day on which this section comes into force. Uh, now, the statute doesn't include, as, as many do, a, uh, that the, the act comes into force on the issuance of royal assent. It also doesn't include the explicit clause that allows uh, governor and council, i.e. federal cabinet, to, to identify when particular sections might come into force. So this leaves open a question as which sections of the Federal Interpretation Act should apply. And there's an argument here that means the governor and council can set a date at any time in the future when the three-year clock would begin to run. Uh, there is, of course, no parallel to BC's DRIPA uh, provision to give an express power to the BC government to enter into agreement with indigenous governing bodies and which also are defined as being authorized to act on behalf of indigenous peoples that hold rights recognized and affirmed by section 35 of the Constitution Act 1982. And there's no real requirement for indigenous consent to the national action plan merely to be engaged in consultation and cooperation. On the other hand, are there some, uh, uh, and of course we have nothing in the preamble as uh, National Chief Perry Bellegarde said, that formally rejects terra nullius and the discovery doctrine. On the other hand, it does affirm the declaration as universal international human rights in, in section four uh, with the de declaration uh, having application in international law that leaves open questions what that really means. Section five, the consultation cooperation must occur. M the plan must take all measures necessary to ensure the laws of Canada are consistent with the declaration. So those are really strong, positive provisions. Uh, Section 6, uh, sub 2a also talks about must include addressing injustices, combating racism. Uh, finally, I think it's uh, one should not just focus on law. If C-15 passes, I think it will have a profound effect on the federal public service. It really can be a game changer on directing federal public service to approach Indigenous peoples and their communities, their organizations, their governments in a different way, as partners, not as uh, recipients of government decisions. Uh, it's trying to make clear that the days of the federal government as a well-meaning big brother, but often terribly misguided at best, is gone. It's now a partnership. Uh, and if there's overwhelming support in parliament, then it really will kind of solidify that sense. And it runs absolutely contrary to the view that uh, most uh, Canadians have had about the prerogatives and parliamentary so sovereignty, ultimately meaning the government of Canada can do whatever it wants. At the same time, we don't know it as a regular bill or becoming a, a, a regular federal statute, is it repealable? Does it so, uh, or does it acquire some form of constitutional character by virtue of its connection to Section 35? That'll be an important issue, I think, going forward in debate and an interpretation of the bill. If we see this as being somewhat embedded legislation, not just a regular statute, as a permanent commitment, then it really requires a very different interpretation of this act and sets the National Action Plan on a very different road going forward. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Professor Morse. Uh, appreciate uh, those comments, especially at the end on some of the strengths and weaknesses of the bill, uh, which we'll return to shortly. We'll go to our last uh, speaker, Laurie Sargent, Assistant Deputy Minister, Department of Justice, Canada.
and then we'll move into the uh, Q&A session. So Lori, uh, welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Roshan. Pleasure to see you. I'm just going to check because my sound doesn't always work well. Can you hear me OK? I hear you fine. Oh, so great. All right. I, uh, I just want to uh, first start by sharing my greetings uh, from my home in Ottawa on uh, beautiful, snow-covered uh, traditional territory of the Algonquin people. Uh, and to thank the elder for his uh, wise and welcoming words. And of course, to all the organizers for the work you've put into uh, this event, which is uh, a, a wonderful opportunity uh, to share, exchange and learn from each other. And I will say that is uh, largely my uh, my goal and, and hope for today. Uh, Listen, I'm I'm following so many amazing speakers, media, uh, ministers, uh, but also experts and uh, and folks with a great deal of experience. I'll just say that I've really had the tremendous privilege of working closely with First Nations, Inuit, and Métis leaders and experts over the past many months on this bill, Bill C-15, uh, as well as, of course, with my team, with our minister's office and, uh, and Minister Bennett and her team. It's really been an opportunity to witness leadership on so many different fronts, uh, primarily, as I say, from Indigenous uh, leaders, and so much of their contribution has been acknowledged today. And, uh, and that is, you know, that is key to why we're here and why I am uh, providing the support that I am with my team to our minister. Um, I'll just take a moment to say that this whole experience has indeed kept me inspired and hopeful for the future of this country as a place where we are deeply committed to upholding human rights and continuously working to strengthen our relationships, even as we navigate uh, through our very challenging current times. So you have heard, as I say, from uh, from so many, I will try to keep my remarks short and uh, focused so that we can move to questions and answers. I'll just touch on a couple of themes that have come up and then look forward to that, uh, that dialogue. Uh, I'll speak briefly to the question of implementation that we've been getting questions about, uh, the interrelationship between the declaration and the constitution, uh, and also the question about uh, why there is not a shared decision-making uh, provision in this legislation. Um, and then I know there will be many more questions to come. So on the question of, uh, of the role of this legislation uh, and its implementation, uh, or sorry, its role in implementing the declaration, truly implementing the declaration is of course going to be a whole of government uh, responsibility. And Bill C-15 will implicate all federal ministers in the development and implementation of the action plan, as well as the review of legislation for consistency. It will also, and I'll just pick up here on a, a point Professor Morris just made, it will very much guide the actions of all federal officials. Uh, it's therefore a durable roadmap uh, that would provide this framework roadmap to guide the development and amendment of all federal laws in the future, as well as, of course, uh, reviewing existing and, and uh, existing laws already in force. It requires us to do so in a way that's reflective of the human rights standards set out in the declaration. And I will just uh, extend my thanks to Dr. Lightfoot for her uh, brilliant overview of all that's come uh, before us from uh, the international human rights world, which is uh, is the one in which I, I had largely worked prior to joining uh, the uh, Aboriginal Affairs Portfolio in Justice. Um, and I'll just perhaps note that this legislation, Bill C-15, is unique in that it actually is taking uh, an international human rights instrument and uh, setting a path forward for its implementation uh, in Canada at the federal level. Again, we have not done that with other human rights treaties to which we're a party. Um, and that has often been a criticism leveled at Canada uh, internationally, 
there are reasons for the approach that's been taken uh, in, in those other contexts, whether it be civil, political rights, economic, social, etc. But here we find ourselves with a unique opportunity and uh, initiative to actually legislate implementation of an international human rights instrument going forward. So this process will require a government to work with Indigenous peoples to identify the processes and approaches for ensuring consultation and cooperation on the types of measures that ought to be pursued as part of aligning our laws and policies with the declaration. Uh, we've heard many concerns already, for example, about our process to get to this stage, and they were touched on uh, a bit in, uh, in the previous session. And I'll just say that this very much reflects what we know we need to do better, and that is to develop these mechanisms uh, and to put the onus on the federal government to do so, but to do so in cooperation and consultation with Indigenous peoples. Um, it is going to be a challenging task and one that I would frankly very much appreciate and welcome the views of, uh, of all those here today on how we might make that uh, work best going forward, recognizing that it's going to require intensive uh, cooperation, innovative new mechanisms, time, but at the same time, a sense of urgency and a need to move things forward together. So, you know, this is one of the key pieces, I think that Bill C-15 uh, will demand of us going forward. In terms of the uh, uh, question of interaction between uh, Bill C-15, the Declaration, and the Canadian Constitution, I, I won't uh, spend too much time on this because I think in many ways it's been covered. The key piece that we have already heard about is, of course, the purpose provision in section four that speaks to the affirmation of the Declaration as uh, an international human rights instrument with application in Canadian law. We understand that to mean that it recognizes that the Declaration can already play a role and should perhaps continue to play and play a greater role in interpreting all Canadian laws, federal, provincial, constitutional, and that that is uh, uh, an affirmation that takes effect immediately. In fact, it actually recognizes that this is already the case um, as reflected in section two of the, uh, of the legislation in the same way that Bill C-262 also recognized that nothing in the act should be construed as delaying the application of the declaration in Canadian law. I'll take a moment just to speak to the non-derogation clause uh, that is a, a bit of a piece of this puzzle as well, just to uh, re reconfirm that uh, you know this this language that we have reflected in uh, section two of the uh, of the bill is uh, and just to be clear, clause two two is language that is drawn from recent legislation, in particular, the Indigenous Languages and Child and Family Services bills. Uh, and it picks up on language recommended by a 2007 Senate committee that uh, was studying the range of non-derogation clauses found in federal statutes and the fact that they weren't all consistent. The recommendation was to use this more positive language of requiring statutes to be interpreted to uphold Section 35 protected rights and not to abrogate or derogate from them. In practice, this clause means that Bill C-15 does not, indeed cannot, be used to diminish uh, Aboriginal or treaty rights protected by the Constitution. It can only be uh, used to build on those rights and build processes, indeed, to uh, implement them going forward. Uh, and I'll also just note that this clause does not speak to the interpretation of the declaration itself, which will continue to be governed by principles of international law. Just turning briefly to uh, then the question of uh, shared decision making, uh, I'll just note that uh, the federal, at the federal level, we certainly recognize the importance of Section 6 and 7 of the BC Declaration legislation. Uh, we've had some very good conversations with Jessica and her team to better understand uh, the purpose and, uh, and effect of those provisions. Um, 
At the federal level in our context, I would just note that we already have some similar agreement related provisions in a number of uh, laws uh, and uh, policies that per permit ministers and the government to negotiate and enter into a variety of agreements and arrangements with Indigenous peoples for particular purposes. So for instance, under the Impact Assessment Act, the responsible minister has the authority, authority to enter into arrangements or agreements with Indigenous governing bodies uh, for a range of specific purposes in relation to impact assessment. Similar uh, uh, provisions exist in the recent Indigenous Languages Act and the First Nations Inuit and Métis Children, Youth and Families Act, Bill C-92. So in the context of Bill C-15, the inclusion of a similar kind of generic provision as found in the BC legislation was uh, viewed as potentially causing some uh, concern or confusion in, in how it would interact with these provisions. And uh, we, will, uh, we will be interested to hear, I think, whether there are uh, ways in which we could uh, consider that as the legislation moves forward, but note that, again, that uh, that capacity already exists in some contexts uh, to enter into, into such agreements. So I think I'll stop there. We fully recognize uh, the, uh, the need for this dialogue as we move through the parliamentary process, and we'll welcome the questions. Thank you. Great. Great. Thank you, Laurie. And maybe I'll just move right into uh, Q&A on your last point. And uh, this is a fairly specific question, and I'll just uh, direct it back to you, Laurie, which is um, in the parliamentary process upcoming, um, maybe you could just talk about how you think or foresee concerns or uh, uh, proposed changes to the bill uh, arising. What are the, the timelines that you're aware of that we're looking uh, to, and how can those voices be heard in the parliamentary process going forward. Sure, uh, thank you, uh, Roshan. So as with uh, all bills, of course, this, uh, this legislation introduced in December will go next to second reading, which is a stage of, uh, of debate uh, by members of parliament, speeches, uh, and usually talking about the goals, objectives of the bill, not a uh, stage for amendments uh, to be proposed, then the bill moves to committee. And uh, that is really where we, uh, we will see the opportunity for uh, witnesses to come before parliament and give their views on the bill, potential improvements and how, uh, how it might be adjusted. So the schedule is very much, uh, of course, not in my hands or even our minister's hands, it is in the hands of parliament. Uh, but I know our minister is looking to move this uh, forward expeditiously and, and certainly hoping that we would get to that stage uh, sometime in March, April, if at all possible. And uh, then, you know, the process repeats uh, in the Senate, uh, subject to some potential uh, ways in which the Senate and, com and uh, House committee procedures can run in parallel. Uh, I won't get into that for now, but essentially it will be that important committee stage in both the House and Senate where witnesses can uh, bring their amendments forward, propose them, and then of course the government will consider them uh, as will the other parties represented uh, at committee. Great, thank you. Anyone else on that specific question? No, then I'm gonna move on like last time, uh, that was a question about process. Most of the questions coming in, um, some are about process, some are more substantive. Um, one about uh, process that I think goes to both BC and Canada, and then certainly from uh, the, the experts on the panel um, about what they foresee and what they expect. Um, it's about the alignment of laws process. Um, and is that, alignment of laws process federally or provincially viewed as one that in, is including, and I'm taking language from the question, uh, indigenous leaders and, and their advisors on one side of a table and government officials on another studying laws against the requirements of the declaration and determining what amendments are needed? Or if that isn't the process, what are ideas around the process so far? Uh, maybe I would turn to BC first. Jessica, do you want to speak to this? 
and then uh, open it up to Lori and certainly everyone on the panel, uh, Doug, Cheryl, uh, Brad, Mary Ellen. Jessica. I must say, thanks for the question. It's definitely one that's pressing in the province. Um, the new mandate for Minister Rankin does have um, his responsibility to bring forward a secretariat to support the coordination of both policy and legislative alignment and development. I do think Indigenous leaders need to be involved and we have already started engagement. It's definitely coming up through our engagement on the action plan of legislative priorities that have been identified um, for quite some time in terms of priority areas uh, for reform. So the two pieces being what's the priority list and what's the process for actually um, working through those reforms and is there new legislation needed? Uh, we don't propose to assume that all the legislation we have is what we need to amend and that new pieces won't be needed. So that is an ongoing engagement that we have now that we are collecting that information and we'll be coming forward uh, hopefully through the secretariat when that's established with some more clarity on that. But I do think it's important for us to consider the process of how legislation is development is developed and that issue around cabinet confidence that is usually at play and how we actively ensure the meaningful participation of indigenous peoples and nations in the legislative process on matters that may affect them. Thanks, Jessica. Uh, anyone else on this issue? Lori, Mary Ellen, Doug, Cheryl, Brad? I'm, I'm happy to weigh in on the issue of the alignment of laws briefly, um, just to say that um, my, my view of, and this is the experience in British Columbia, I think that we're in at the moment, is that there's a positive obligation on government to align its laws, policies, and practices. So I don't take the view that you have to go and amend a whole bunch of statutes, for instance. Um, I do think we have to read statutes consistent with the declaration and we need to make that an ordinary process, just like we read statutes consistent with the Charter of Rights or other instruments. So we need to find um, every opportunity to do consistent alignment. Clearly there are going to be examples where legislation is very offside. And federally, we can say like the Indian Act is a good example. It just absolutely doesn't square with inherent rights and self-determination of indigenous people to impose a colonial structure um, on indigenous peoples. So on that one, it's pretty hard to make it align. Furthermore, some, many of us would say, we don't wanna rehabilitate the Indian Act. We wouldn't want it to align and be interpreted. In fact, if you looked at it, and it was juxtaposed with the UNDRIP, we pretty much quickly be peeling it away. But the question again comes to a very core point, which is Bill C-15 is just one very important piece of legislation. Don't get me wrong, and we should get it right and prove it. But there's many other things that government needs to do, including the government of Canada, like have more positive recognition legislation for the rebuilding and reconstitution of indigenous governments. And I would just say from my viewpoint, I'm not asking them to give us permission, but since 2016, there were commitments to many things. So I don't wanna overload Bill C-15. It's supposed to implement UNDRIP to bring the framework in a robust way. It's gonna require multiple changes, but it does require some good and active processes. There were committee processes for a bit to align laws and review the laws of Canada. That was a short-lived process. I do think that's important in British Columbia. We are having to do that. We see there's a challenge in the Supreme Court now in the Desitel case on whether the Wildlife Act needs to be read consistently with DRIPA. That's an active issue. British Columbia took a position before 2019. They didn't necessarily even change their position after 2019. But today I would imagine that British Columbia would say pretty clearly, it has to align with DRIPA. So at some point we have to have a place to do that work where indigenous people are represented. So I see the need to reconsider how we do much of this work and the distrust and the building of trust is going to come by creating those opportunities, not overloading this bill to have like 300 more provisions, but showing real sincere opportunities to do that work. And although we say it's hard, it's gonna take time. I don't actually think it's that hard. I think it's just a question of do people pay attention to it and do they wish to get on with this work? Thanks, Mary Ellen. Lori, I think you were unmuting earlier. I was unmuting. Um, I, 
really mostly to say I think you know the federal government in some ways is um, wanting to learn from BC's experience in this regard and we will um, we will certainly be keen to see how uh, they are approaching uh, Minister Rankin's uh, mandate commitment but to answer the bottom line question, absolutely, it's going to have to be done in partnership. Uh, and I think that is uh, is the point that also Mary Ellen was making. We have experience to build on, including the work that's been done to develop recent legislation, Bill C-91, 92, and others. And our processes are still not perfect, but we are evolving, as Jessica's pointed out as well, getting more comfortable with um, processes that involve uh, sharing and more uh, openness and transparency uh, in in the process. Um, so I, you know, I think there's a lot we can build on and learn from. I'll just put out there, Rashan, you mentioned the uh, process in relation to the charter and uh, the work that was done. And I actually went back to, to look at the report from 1985 uh, uh, of the Parliament, Parliamentary Committee that did an extensive study of, uh, of legislation for compatibility with Section 15, the equality provision. Um, I'm not you know, that's again, that's not within my purview, but I do think there's got to be some further consideration also of how Parliament itself can consider how it wishes to uh, to engage in this uh, in this important work. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Um, we only we have time for maybe one or two more questions. I'd like to uh, direct this one maybe to Doug uh, White and Dr. Lightfoot uh, first, if they want to comment on it. Um, we have a number of of comments and questions coming in about whether this legislation and then under generally how it might support um, appropriate and principled treaty implementation, historic treaty implementation in particular. Um, and I don't know um, who wants to kick off discussing that. I can, I can jump sure. in. Uh, yeah, thanks for that question. I think that's uh, it's an important part of the uh, where Indigenous peoples are at with uh, Canada and, and BC here. Uh, where I'm from in Snanemo, we have the treaty from 1854, which was, uh, you know, its basic uh, idea was that the fledgling colony of Vancouver Island wanted to access mining, wanted to access coal in our territory. And it was not a controversial idea that to do so, they needed the consent of the Snanemo to do that. Uh, they needed to recognize the Aboriginal title of Snanemo to to do that and so of course here in bc that was the in 1854 that was the last time that the crown uh operated in that mode for for a very long period of time and so now uh you know we've got i mean th this is the you know the issue uh, we, we have the treaty from 1854 that exists it is a fact that is a basic reality of history that we entered into an agreement in 1854 that was denied uh, for over 100 years uh, until the 1960s when we entered into the White and Bob litigation, Clifford White and David Bob out hunting. We went to the Supreme Court of Canada. The Supreme Court of Canada agreed that the treaty continues to exist and matter uh, and that it has implications, legal implications. It means that the province can't interfere with the continuity of the treaty right. Uh, you know, later on, we get to 1982, we've got the Section 35 that affirms uh, those treaty rights. Um, I remember when I showed up as the chief of Snanemo in 2009, I was stunned at the capacity of the Crown to deny those basic facts of history and law. It's breathtaking that they can deny the reality of the Treaty of 1854. They can deny the efficacy or the, the meaningfulness of the Supreme Court of Canada decision from 1965. And they can, uh, they can write the words of Section 35 and not do anything about it, not implement them in any meaningful way. And so for me, the, you know, if we're, this is sort of a major, for me, it, what we need is a turning point in our history together where the crown once and for all shifts into, creates the opportunity to shift into real recognition of uh, those treaties, of the idea of self-determination, 
uh, in a way that equips, uh, you know, the, the big thing is to uh, give direction to their mechanisms and their institutions to do that work. Um, so, I mean, that's the, I mean, in my mind, uh, those are some of the things that come to mind for uh, uh, when you ask that question. Thanks. Thanks, Doug. Dr. Lightfoot. Yeah, thank you, Doug. I appreciate that. Um, I'm just, I know we're running short on time, so I just want to add uh, two quick points to that discussion. First of all, let's recall, um, building on Doug's earlier comments in his presentation, uh, one of the earliest motivations for Indigenous peoples approaching the international community, and this goes back to the 1920s, uh, Diskahe coming from Haudenosaunee territory, uh, Ratana coming from Aotearoa, New Zealand. They approached the international community at the League of Nations at that time specifically to have their treaties recognized by the international community as having legal force. They approached the Crown in London, they approached the League of Nations. Uh, at that point, they didn't get uh, much attention. They were sent back and told to deal with their uh, problems domestically with uh, New Zealand and with Canada. So that was not an acceptable result. And then the movement in the 70s that began uh, in a number of locations around the world, again, was in part to have those treaties recognized. And if we look at the earliest documents coming out of those early international conversations, treaties are central uh, to many Indigenous peoples' understandings of their self-determination. And of course, it's less operational here in BC. It's a different context. But in many, many, many other locations, modern, historic uh, treaties are, are definitely in play. And that did get placed into the declaration. Uh, Indigenous peoples, of course, brought forward that provision. It's now appearing in Article 37 of the declaration itself, which states that Indigenous peoples have the right to the recognition, observance, and enforcement of treaties, agreements, and other constructive arrangements concluded with states or their successors. So that means Canada has obligations uh, to take up of its successor state and that states must honor and respect such treaties, agreements and other constructive arrangements. So the direction coming out of the declaration is quite clear on, on the treaty question. Great. Thank you, that's, that's really helpful. Anyone else on that question specifically? Okay. I mean, I, I'm just looking at the time and see we've, we've hit uh, the, uh, the time we had allocated for questions and answers. And I just wanna take a moment to thank this panel and all of the panelists for their uh, tremendous contributions and insights and range of perspectives uh, on Bill C-15 and the work in British Columbia. Um, I think uh, uh, it's, it's been really valuable for everyone who could participate. I, I will acknowledge again, there are dozens and dozens of comments and questions we haven't gotten near, but um, there is uh, the intention that a document will be written coming out of today's session that through it both can summarize what was heard today, but also address many of the questions and themes that have been raised and running throughout. So that will be one thing coming out of today. And maybe with that in mind, uh, I'll turn it over to Dr. Mary Ellen Chapelle-Lafon to give some closing remarks on behalf of the Centre and some last reflections on this panel and the morning as a whole. Yes, I just want to say that um, it's fantastic to have had this um, sharing of views and of course I wish we didn't have a virtual circle that we were actually together where we could really have that feeling of being heard. I also just want to acknowledge that there is so much um, important leadership and Indigenous leadership in British Columbia. I know amongst our panel our uh, participants today were people like Kuti, Judy Wilson, um, and I always want to rec recognize her and, of course, the Manuel family, the leadership that they've taken on the rights of Indigenous people. Um, and I also want to lift up and stand up um, many of the individuals that Doug White the Third QC mentioned earlier. And to thank again Elder Shane Point for being here and for always providing cultural leadership and support to us in the work that we do together. So thank you. Um, and I think and on that point about leadership, I think it's really important to make sure that we support processes where First Nations, Métis and Inuit leadership will have their voices heard on this legislation, that that includes indirect discussion with the Crown, whether that's Canada or British Columbia, 
And that also means in the parliamentary process, because those processes themselves have been quite flawed. Very often we see legislation, people feel it's rushed, they can't consider it, they can't hear it. The fact that people take it so seriously that they need to process it is a good sign, in my opinion. It's not a bad sign. It's, it's, the message isn't slow down. The message really is, let's make sure we can get this right if it works. And then, and as we go forward, if something doesn't work, let's make sure we can improve it. So that constant approach of improvement. And again, I would just say in terms of um, Elder Shane Point, you know, he's been very strong as an advisor to us as we've been dealing with exposing anti-Indigenous racism in healthcare, and really has talked about the need to deal with very difficult subjects not necessarily from a perspective of shaming and blaming, but from a perspective of change, which doesn't mean we don't do truth telling. There is a lot of truth telling, unraveling the colonial legacy in the spirit of what the residential school survivors asked for with the TRC when they said they wanted UNDRIP implemented fully in Canada and the Truth and Reconciliation Report, survivors were very strong to say, don't suppress the truth of these experiences but make changes so future generations are not powerless, that rights will be respected, individual and collective rights. So I just really wanted to conclude by saying that I'm so um, grateful that there, there are like many people that should be on these panels today talking, debating and engaging. And also during this pandemic, you know, people have said, well, we're so busy during the pandemic, can we deal with the rights of indigenous people? Well, the pandemic has displayed to us in plain sight how the rights of Indigenous people are vulnerable and also that for Indigenous people have been more affected than any other people by the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, we are, have to learn lessons in real time. We need to take some strong measures to protect and shift our laws and practices, but we have to do in a respectful way. So. I just wanted to say in conclusion, um, just from a process viewpoint, how much at UBC at the Residential School History and Dialogue Center, we welcome feedback, we welcome the dialogue. As you mentioned, Roshan, we will prepare a summary and then we'll make it available. And if you see it and you have a comment, please provide a comment. Um, but also we do want to make sure that First Nations Métis and Inuit have their leadership forums and opportunities to express their views. This is a public forum today, um, but we want to be sure that we respect those and support them. And also to support the voices of people like Romeo Saganish, who has been a remarkable leader here. All of the residential school survivors who, as I say, took, went through this horrific, what many of us would consider a genocide, that has not been fully accounted for and have taken their life's work to advocate for proper respect and protection of the rights of indigenous people. And I think as Doug White mentioned, with the White and Bob decision and the, uh, the advocacy of the leadership in his community at Sinemo to have even their treaty recognized, you know, within the last 50 years, properly recognized and supported, we need to get this era of denial and fighting behind us. We need to get into the era of recognition and respectful relationships. We need to address this. So this is a very important piece and I really appreciate our conversations today and our dialogues, but we have to understand behind us is a strong sense of urgency for change at the community level and no doubt a strong sense of impatience. I know I see it in my students at the law school, the indigenous law students and others that are anxious to get on with this work. And so we need to make sure we create opportunities for them to be heard and do the work they need to do. So I'm going to end it there. And thank you again, Roshan, for acting as uh, co-chair and facilitator for our dialogue today. Great. Thanks, Mary Ellen. And just a last thank you to everyone for all your remarks and participation and uh, questions. And uh, certainly a, a thank you to all of the staff at the center who pulled off uh, this session this morning. So I hope everyone has a good rest of their day and uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon. Take care.